the dog, but I'll just sort of log on, say hello in a quick wave to everyone, and how are you? Yay. Thanks. Good man. Uh, okay, well, I've still got some people coming in, so I'll, uh, I will admit them as well. That new jacket, Al. I was just going to say that. What, what, what the, Showing the, off. The one in the corner. Yeah. yeah. What, the head jacket. Um, yeah. I was going to, is this you getting some shameless publicity in there, Mr. Smith? <laughs> the <free stuff. laughs> oh, I, I wouldn't dream of it, Chris. I wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> I bet Matt Bloody Humphreys has sent that down just as, and said, put that on your skis. I, I've, I've been looking for pictures and all sorts to try and put up in the... Uh, I'll, in the I'll have to go like that and put my socks on and everything. <laughs> excellent. Oh, excellent. Oh, Ali, you, you do know the flip side to all, all of the head stuff that you post about, you know, being the most winning brand at the World Championships, all that stuff. You, you do realise the flip side to that is that every good turn you've ever made is down to the equipment and not to any skill that you have, right? <laughs> hey, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to admit that. I, I've never once said that I'm Mark, a good skier. You, Mark, you said good turns? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know... Low skill, good equipment. It, it probably balances somewhere more down here, doesn't it? Yeah. You know. <laughs> it's good no, to see the band that started it's already. Yeah, it's, it's always good fun. You know, just let's have a look at the end of the season results, and we'll see who's sitting on top of the tree. I, I was actually surprised, Scott, that your 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 comment on Ali's thing was was remarkably well thought out, and and. <laughs> it wasn't really designed to have a dig at all, and I thought, no, 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 I, I can't have that. We've got to poke more fun at this one. <laughs> You know, I'm just, you know, get shedding some light on the fact that everybody and, let, you know, most people, 99% of the people, they actually turn, whereas head are pretty good at just going fast, which we don't. So that's, that's, that's a, I couldn't agree more. That's you know, right. so I like to call if, us if the, the public brand. in general, <laughs> if the public in general want to ski at 130 kilometers an hour, then get head stuff. Otherwise, other brands really do the job better. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, this this debate could go on for hours and hours and hours. I mean, but I mean Ali, Ali, the best bit is with this as well. So yeah. whilst all that stuff's being posted on Facebook, right? We're instant, we're all still messaging each other at the same time. So can we say this in public about each other? <laughs> oh, dear. So oh, all, dear. all meant in the best possible, best exactly. possible way. We're, we're all all friends in the, the ski and snowboarder and telemark and Nordic world. So, um, okay, well, we've we've got we've got quite a few on. So what we'll do is it's um, um, five past one. We'll we'll uh, we'll get going. I'll I'll keep admitting the, the those that are coming in or are joining. So, um, welcome everyone. Hello. Hope everyone's doing well and keeping um, keeping sane and uh, and mentally strong. Um, Thank, thankfully, we got we got a bit of good news from uh, one of the indoor centres uh, yesterday, Hemel Snow Centre. They've they've announced that they're going to open from the the twelfth of April, so we can start getting some turns at some point. Um, I've been looking out for anything um, from Snow Zone and Chill Factor, and so I don't know if anyone on here has heard anything with regards to any other Snow Zones or Chill Factor or anything like that. So we, we, we haven't heard, we haven't heard anything in Mountain Keynes, Ali. You've not, no, Di. Not saying. Okay. All right. Well, ho hopefully in the next few days we'll get some clarity on that. And um, obviously, travel, travel-wise, they're they're talking that there could could be the chance of summer holidays, and so we might be able to get to the mountains, summer, autumn. It, it, they're saying it could be happening. So, fingers crossed, everyone. We're all we're all moving in the right direction, and um, we can uh, get back on them lovely skis or telemark or. Um, everything that we love doing at some point soon so um just a, a quick couple of intros for people that have not met or seen these things before so we've got chris best from rosie if you give us a quick little wave uh, chris chris is um uh, <coughs> the big big i am for rosignal uk <laughs> uh, i could i could flip that the other way <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and uh chris is uh, chris is going to do a little presentation on rosignal equipment and then um, we've got some questions that have been sent in and uh, he's going to answer those. Then he'll open it up to any questions from you guys. So he can talk about all the lovely Rosinal equipment. And um, we've got 
Scott Hammond from um, Norway, who's, who's enjoying the, the lovely mountains out there um, <laughs> as we speak. Um, Scott is a telemarker. We had some people last week ask about telemark. So Scott is the IAZ uh, educator for telemark. And he's also part of the Norwegian system, um, DNS. And he's an educator and part of the technical committee there. Um, oh, someone's unwrapping something. Sorry. Quite all right. <laughs> um, so we've it's got. It's only proper paper, nothing exciting, like a <laughs> pair of head skis. <laughs> Definitely not that exciting. <laughs> Um, and we've also got Ian that's done the, the off-piece chats for the last couple of weeks. He's going to continue on with, with that. Mark Shaxted, as most of you know, he's going to do a little chat on some bumps or intro to bump skiing and, and develop that for, for next week, I believe. And obviously you've got the host, the, the gorgeous myself. Um, I'm going to do a little chat on some um, uh, instructor info uh, a little bit later on. Um, and just to let you know that on the uh, in two weeks time we've got Matt Collinson who is a podiatrist and foot and leg specialist he's going to be coming on and doing some chat about biomechanics and foot alignment and um, um, some other bits and pieces um, he's going to talk about he's got he does have instructor qualifications um, but he is a specialist in that field and he has been for about 10 years I believe so um, Matt's going to come on and I'm in, I'm in communication with a few other people for the next couple of weeks. So hopefully this, this void that we've got until around about mid-April, we can keep filling you all up with some lovely chat presentations and some smiley faces. Um, and um, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll go from there. So if I can ask everyone if they can mute themselves, just so we don't have any unwrapping going on in the background. Um, <laughs> um, we're going to get started with Chris... Lovely Best is going to kick off, and uh, when you're ready, Chris, if you want to take the floor, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, hi to everybody. Hope you're all doing really well out there. I've just had a quick scan through. There's some faces I recognise out there and some that I don't. Um, so what I'll do is I'll give a bit of a, an introduction into myself, who I actually am, uh, you know, how I've been involved with Rosignol. Tell you a little bit about Rosnall's history um, as a brand, where we've been, where we're going, all of the future. Uh, we've seen some questions that have come through. Alice, Alice posted some of those, uh, and some of the chat maybe about what's going to be happening in the future. So I might give you a little bit of a tour around our virtual showroom for 21, 22, so we can show you some of the exciting stuff that's going to go on out there. And then, as Ali mentioned earlier on, anybody that's got any questions that they want to fire out at the end please feel due to do so, and I'll uh, try my best to answer them all for you, yeah. Um, I'd like to also thank Ali for inviting me along, giving me this uh, opportunity to come along and try and slag head skis off as much as I possibly can to get my own back on Matt Humphreys from last week. <laughs> uh, and I also, I also want to apologise in advance because I'm in deepest, darkest Staffordshire and my internet signal can be appalling. So if it goes off, please don't think I've dropped off the end of the world it's probably just bad internet connection from this side. Um, so as you can all probably tell uh, from my dulcet Geordie accent, I grew up in the Northeast. I don't know how many of you actually know that the, the Northeast is quite a ski in Mecca, uh, or it was up until numerous years ago where we used to get an absolute shed load of snow there on an annual sort of basis. It was quite commonplace for, for us to have snow on the ground from November right the way through till April, you know, Every, every year. Uh, that was backed up with several dry ski slopes all over the place. We had lots of opportunity to get out and about on the snow uh, and dry ski slopes, obviously. I was quite lucky. I lived in a little village called Castleside, uh, which is just out of the, outside of an old steelworks town called Consul. I don't know whether you knew it. Um, and it's right on the edge of the northern Pennines, up at about 1,300 feet. Uh, and I was quite lucky that the local YMCA <coughs> would come along set up a pile of rope tours, put snow fencing up. Uh, they had it flood lit. So I could ski literally from four o'clock after I finished school right the way through till almost half past 10 at night. And that was just an annual thing. It was just like being able to go down and access the football pitch. You know, it was there on our doorstep. So I was very fortunate. It's not something that the family had really done historically. It's something that just found me rather than anything else. Um, I'm sure like all of you out here, you know, as soon as you've had that first test of skiing, you're, you're bitten by the bug. Um, so I was, I was into it. You know, every opportunity I get, I go skiing. 
uh, whether that be on the dry ski slope at Spectrum in Bishop Auckland or over at uh, Silksworth in, in uh, Sunderland area. I was, I was there, I was living and breathing skiing all of the time. So quickly become quite a, a big part of my life. Um, and as anybody does, you start sort of experimenting with sort of maybe a little bit of the competitive side. I soon realized that I wasn't going to be the next uh, Alberta Tomba, uh, although I did race for a number of years, and but recognized that pretty quickly I wasn't really going to make it to the next Olympics or anything like that. So my focus maybe shifted from the racing side of things and moved over more to the teaching side. Um, I was fortunate enough that when I was racing, at the time there was lots of money in the ski industry, and I did get sponsored by Rosignol, so they were helping me out with some skis, and so that was my first partnership, if you like, with Rosignol as a child. Um, but then, as I said, more as I got involved in the teaching side of things, I definitely got more involved with definitely got more involved with the brand on a professional level. Um, I was doing a lot of tech rep work for them. I was doing a lot of ski tests for them. Uh, I was doing a lot of trade shows for them. So that was really how I, I first got involved with Rosignol. And suffice to say, uh, the first time I was involved, I was 13 years old. Uh, I'm now maybe 50. Oh, well, I am 50, 50 last year. Forgot about that one. Uh, so it has been pretty much my entire life. I've never worked for another brand, although I have been outside of the Rosignol business. I've worked in the travel industry for a while. Um, but as I say, Rosignol has pretty much been my life right the way through the teaching, everything else. Uh, I qualified as a IS international ski teacher diploma when I was 21, lots of years ago. Uh, I don't really use my instructor's license as much as I should do anymore. Oh, nice. um, but it's still there, it's something that I'm very passionate about. And again, being a, a massive part of my life. Uh, I still get involved quite heavily with a lot of race coaching during sort of the summer times. Um, because we work quite closely with uh, a, a, a crowd you might know, Team Evolution. Um, so we help set up and run a lot of their camps during, during the, uh, the summer period and the winter period as well. Um, that's pretty much, I, I don't want to sort of dwell too much on me, but uh, I, I prefer to get in and show you a little bit about who we are actually as a brand. So I'm going to see if I can use the wonders of modern technology and share a screen here. Let's fingers crossed. Hopefully this should play. I can see your screen, Chris. Is it on, Ali? It's not playing the video, though, no. Ah, it hasn't started playing, sorry. No worries. It's in, I am screen sharing. Yeah, you, you're screen sharing. Uh, I can see the two files there, but the video is not playing. Uh, right, wait on. Give me two seconds. No worries. We've got seven or eight weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the video might be playing in the background. <clears throat> yeah, has it not come through? I think if, if it was a head video, it would play, Ali. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> it would if it was a head video, definitely. <laughs> you might need to minimise the, um, the, uh, the file browser screen and just bring the, um, the video up to the front. Let me try that again. So if I go into, into the actual... <clears throat> share screen file and then if I go into the video file then if I do that there just click on that on the brand movie should be mate better no is, no. it, is, it, is it playing for you Chris are you, are you watching it's, the video yeah right? it's playing for me that is very strange yeah. 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 Unfortunately not, mate. 
Yeah, no, that's, uh, apologies for that, everybody. The wonders of modern technology there. Uh, that was just, it was a brief overview of the, uh, of the brand and sort of a little bit of its history and who we are and what we are at heart. Our strap line at the minute is we call it another best day. And I didn't have any involvement in that name whatsoever and did try and explain to the French that it made no sense whatsoever. But another best day in the mountains, I think basically sums up, you know, what everybody feels regardless whether you're, you know, job blogs, holiday maker going away one or two weeks a year, whether you're an instructor, a racer, you know, it's basically, it's all of the experiences that we get out of the, the pleasure of being out there in the mountains. And that's what we want to try and sort of encapsulate as a brand. And we no longer just focus on being a ski brand. We want to be sort of pretty much synonymous with the entire winter sports and summer sports. People just like Ali, he's very passionate about his head stuff there in the background. We want to have all of the... <laughs> All of, all of our range available sort of all year round, whether that be spring, summer, autumn, winter, we want to have an offering available for all of our followers pretty much all year round. So um, it's not only hardware that we're working on now, we've got a, a huge textile range, which is a, a big grown thing for us in the UK at this moment in time and, and globally. Um, we've got a big Snickers division. Uh, I don't know whether you, uh, know that Rosignol's heavily involved in cycling now as well at the moment. Uh, several years ago, we bought out two brands, a brand called Felt and a brand called Time. Uh, so they still run as individual brands, but we generated a Rosignol sort of hybrid mountain bike as well. So that sits there in the background. So there's all sorts of things going on that's associated with mountain sports. Um, the brand itself, we're uh, 100 and well, it was 1907, you'll see on a lot of the, a lot of the marketing stuff that we do, 1907 was the year of sort of Rosinol's birth. Um, so it's now, it's well over 100, 120 years old now. Um, it was set up by a guy called Abel Rosignol. Uh, that was who was a carpenter. I don't know whether you know that. And I don't know whether any, any of you actually know what Rosignol actually stands for. Hands up, anybody that does? No. So Rosignol in French is Nightingale. So it was Abel Nightingale, that was, his, that was his surname. That's actually what it is. And that's why you see the rooster or the Rosinol sort of on all of the, on all of the uh, products and stuff that we sort of developed now. But Abel was a, a carpenter and initially he was uh, preparing sort of goods for the, um, for the textile industry. He was making spindles and all sorts of um, wheels and everything that would be used in the textile industry to help sort of the the, the, the weaving of fabrics and everything else. Uh, it was then approached quite early on uh, by the French army to see if he could take his carpentry skills and adapt them into making skis because they'd heard that the Norwegians were able to slide around sort of quite quickly on these long planks of wood. So in typical, typical form, you know, rather than, um, you know, just thinking about it, off he goes to Norway, finds out a little bit more about what was going on came back on with all of that information and uh, set up his first factory, which was in a little place called Guaron, which is just outside of Grenoble. Um, and that's where the ski production started and has pretty much remained right the way throughout the entire um, Rosignol history. It's something that we're very, very proud of. Um, Rosignol is a brand, it's always been about sort of innovative products. So, um, but getting innovation through working with partners that can really help develop the brand and sort of move it forwards. I think from some of the older people out there, one of the biggest allies that worked with uh, Rosendahl early days was a guy called Emil Alias. Um, he was very instrumental in the first generation of racing skis that came out. Uh, very instrumental of sort of developing one of Rosendahl's best ever selling skis, which was the Olympic 41. Uh, this was back in 1937 and went on to win the, uh, the world championships on those. I think that was probably one of our first medals that we got in, uh, in a world championship then. One of our only ones from this year as well. <laughs> um, but so again, a, a very proud history of that. Um, Abel Rosignol was um, involved in the business pretty much right the way throughout his entire life until 1956, when it got bought out by a guy called uh, Laurent Boisvive, and he remained president of the, the group uh, right the way through from 1956 all the way through to 2005. And that saw the, 
the huge boom period of skiing through the 80s. Um, products that you might remember like the Rosignol 4S. Uh, we're still very proud of the fact that the Rosignol 4S is the only ski that has ever sold more than a million pairs of just one single model of ski. I don't think that, I don't think the actual world, world production there is a million pairs of all the brands put together of what's going on. So to do that just on one model, it was massive. And you got to think back to those days, that was when one model of ski would serve to ski the bumps, serve to ski the off-piste, everything. So it was a one ski, did a bit of, bit of everything there. Um, I think any company has its good times and its bad times. Um, so our bad time, unfortunately, happened when... In 2005, uh, Mr. Bravi decided that he was going to sell the Rosenall Group, uh, and he sold it to quite a well-known brand called Quicksilver, that a lot of you will know about. Um, brand was sold in 2005 for 870 million euros, so it's quite a good return on the uh, on his investment over the years. But within a year and a half, Quicksilver had actually managed to pretty much bankrupt the entire brand. Um, it was on its knees, absolutely on its knees. Um, and this is a game where me and my, my, my good colleague, Matt, had, had always have a bit of a laugh and a joke because one of the biggest chains around our neck was our race department, uh, where all of the races were being paid sort of, you know, huge amounts of money. The likes of your Lindsay Vons at the time, Bordy Millers, Ted Ligeties, Julia Mancusos, all of these people run sort of big salaries from the brand. And unfortunately, at that point, we had to really let them go from their contracts just so the brand could actually survive. We had guys that were working in the factory that were in the product development team that weren't even taking a salary from the brand. But such was their passion and devotion to Rosignol itself. They were working free of charge just to try and sort of let the brand sort of continue. Um, thankfully, the hold Quicksilver had over the brand didn't last very long. In fact, it was only two years. And they sold it back to one of the original chief execs, a, a guy called Bruno Serpli. Uh, he bought it back in 2008, and they paid just under 20 million euros. So from an 870 million sell price to a purchase back for 20 million, you can see what Quicksilver had done to the brand over that period of time. Um, so it was a real question of sort of re reinventing everything that was going on then. Um, difficult times, you know, 2008 with the crash and everything that was going on around through the world economy. So it was only with re real vision about where the brand was going to expand into and in different divisions, um, you know, that we've managed to survive and sort of get back to, back to what we're doing now. Um, <laughs> so in terms of... Um, brand positioning, you know, where in terms of sales, sales-wise, the Rosignol Group, uh, as you may know, incorporates not only Rosignol, it incorporates Dina Star, uh, as well as Lang Ski Boots into that. Um, so we have, we have that as part of our group. We also have Kerma Ski Poles, Luck Bindings as part of the group as well. Um, we've got some, uh, an, an ice skating called Rice Sport. So we've got products that are done there as well for ice skates as well as the bikes and everything else that I mentioned earlier on. Um, textiles been a huge part of the, the, the group's growth over the last few years, and they sought to get some investment that came in from an outside arm. Um, and they brought in five years ago uh, an investment company called Sandbridge Investment, which is made up of three huge chief execs from sort of multi-conglomerate companies all over the world. One of them happened to be a, a fashion designer and apparently one day he's going to make it pretty good. Uh, he goes by the name of Tommy Hilfiger. Um, so he owns a 30% stake in sort of the Rosenthal textile business at this moment in time. Um, and that was a magical moment for us because to have a, a name like that associated with the textile, um, it's a very close synergy between the two brands anyhow, using a lot of the red, white, and blues, obviously from the French flag. Um, so that's allowed us to really sort of grow and expand sort of what we, what we do as a business uh, year on year. Very proud of our products. I said we've always been very innovative. Again, some of you might remember um, 
the 90s, we brought out a range of skis which were called the Bandit series. Uh, Bandits were the first range of skis that come out that classed themselves as all mountain skis. Um, it was a really easy thing at the time. If you remember, we had the X, the double X, and the triple X. It was very simple for people to identify where they skied on the mountain. For somebody that did 70% on piece, 30% off piece, uh, you know, you'd get the X. Or if you were 50 50, you'd be the double X or vice versa on the triple X. So, again, that was one of the the benchmark products that really changed the way we think about skiing and skis, skis as a whole now. Um, that really started the massive sort of development of where we were. Um, I think we've definitely got to take a, a big doth of our cap to the snowboard division as well. Um, skiing got quite boring in the, in the early 2000s. And that's where we found a lot of skiers were leaving the sport and going into snowboarding because it was a new thrill, it was a bit more exciting. Um, so we did see numbers start to sort of dwindle there and snowboards start to increase quite dramatically. Um, and that, I think, was where the ski product guys got a little bit nervy and started going into the uh, snowboard divisions uh, workshops and stuff and looking at all of the materials that were being used in there. And they were finding all these really quirky, quirky things like titanium, carbons, basalts, all these different lightweight woods, polonias and stuff that uh, snowboard guys have been using for years. And they came up and they concocted a ski that some of you might have heard, uh, which launched 2012, called the Soul 7. Um, the Soul 7, again, I think is quite fair to say, changed what we all perceive as what a free ride ski would be. Even though it was targeted as a, a ski that's 106 millimeters wide, that Personally, at the time, I wouldn't have gone anywhere near. It made it accessible to the masses. It was a ski that was ultra versatile. We could use it on piste. We could use it off piste. You know, you could use it on the bulletproof ice. It was very flexible. So rather than a ski that was just marketed towards the 20 somethings, we equally found guys that was in the 70 somethings still hooning around all over the mountain on the Soul 7. So it was a massive success for the group and allowed us to really sort of establish ourselves back into the market sort of on that side of things. So it's been a really interesting journey as a, as a, as a brand um, across, the, across the 120 years plus. Um, its ethos is still all about, you know, being innovative as a brand um, and delivering the consumers, you know, the best experience, the best times that they're ever going to get sort of out and about there on the mountain. So that gives you just a bit of an overview and a bit of a flavour of the history of the brand. Uh, I know Ali had some questions that um, he'd like to fire through. I might have to give me virtual showroom a skip if the uh, <laughs> if well, I'm not sharing videos very well. We'll, we'll see, if, see if it does in a bit, but we'll, we'll go through some of the questions, Chris, and then we'll open it up to everyone to see if they've got some as well. And then, yeah, um, yeah if we can get the, um, the, the showroom going, then cool. Um, so... I'll kick off with one that has come in, which was, why, why should I buy Rosinol P-Skis instead of Head, K2, Nordica, Salomon, or any other brands? Very simple. Number one. <laughs> 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 Who are the others? <laughs> I think, no, in, in, all, in all fairness, but for me, you know, taking, taking my brand loyalty aside and everything, there is not a bad, a bad product out there on the market at the moment. You know, we've got so many brands that are out there and there's so much time invested into making the product the best it can be. For one ski to come to the market, it takes nearly two to three years before it will hit the shelves. So there's been a pile of testing gone on, back to the drawing board, change that, tweak that a little bit. So before it actually gets onto anybody consumer wise's feet, we already know it's going to give them the best experience. But so does Head. So does Dinastar, so does Atomic, so does Salomon. Everybody's working on the whole thing. So I do think there is a, a lot of people have a brand allegiance, you know, you typical example. And if you've worked and been on a product, you get confidence with it. Um, I sometimes use an analogy, you know, if you've got a, um, a set of Experience 84s, you know, Mark's got a set, you've got a set. If you've got on Mark's set of Experience 84s, it'd probably feel completely different to the set that you've got. 
And it's a bit like going out and buying a Fiesta. You and your next door neighbor could buy a Fiesta from the same store on exactly the same day in the same color. But when you get behind the wheel, that's your car. You get it to your next door neighbors. It feels slightly different. You know, you're comfortable with what you've got. It gives you your confidence. And if that's on a set of rosy skis or atomic or head, whatever it is, if you're comfortable and it gives you confidence and puts a smile on your face, that's what it's all about. Yeah, I, I think um, I think with regards to um, ski equipment, it is if you can get on it and try it before you buy it, you you will find out and know what you right. like. And um, it's not necessarily go on price point. It's not go on what someone else says. It's it's about the feel and relating it to yourself, to, to what you want to achieve. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with you, Chris. So, um, next. Think, so just a quick one on that. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's great, you know, you guys down, you, I know you're using sort of uh, Hamel a, a lot down there, the Snow Centre. Snow Rock's fantastic because they should have a range of all of their skis in that they're stocking for the following year. That's a great opportunity to get out and sort of try. I know you're not going to get the full experience, but you'll get the, the general gist of what the ski is going to do, uh, you know, when you get out onto the, onto the hills there as well. So that's that's something definitely to take up on opportunity-wise. Yeah, cool. Um, <clears throat> the next question is, what piece ski would you recommend for an intermediate aspiring expert lady skier? Height, five foot three, weight, roughly 58 kilograms. Who is generally happily uh, happy on 150, 153 skis? Yeah, perfect. For uh, out of our range, uh, I'd aim you for something like a Nova Six. Um, a Nova Six, it sits right in the middle. We've got a Nova Two, a Nova Four, a Six, an Eight, and a Ten. So it sits right in the middle of where we are in in, in the tree there. Um, what we try and do when it comes to lady skis. There's been a big backlash. Everybody's been talking about sort of weight reduction in skis for a number of years now and trying to make the lightest product out there. I think personally, if you take weight away from a, a product, the one thing that you lose all of the time is going to be some of the performance of the product. You never find a lightweight set of race skis. They're always going to weigh a ton, you know, because of all of the metal, the titanium and everything that's gone into that. So we try and use the right materials to build confidence for the end user wherever they are. So, as I say, a progressive intermediate, it's gonna have a nice soft tip on the ski, quite solid underneath the middle part of the, of, of the foot. So it's gonna be very engaging when they tip it over onto the edge of the ski, they're gonna find that they can get carving sensations really. Put that smile on the people's face all the time. So we want it to be as effortless as we possibly can. So for me, Nova 6 all day long, yeah. Cool, perfect. Um, what skis would you recommend for an intermediate, advanced, mainly all mountains, slightly off piste? Very easy one as well. Again, the way we uh, break our break our range down, um, we have a, a segment for piste, which for men and men and ladies is going to be the React and the Nova skis. Anything that's we class as an all mountain ski, we call it um, uh, an experience for men and ladies. And then anything that's free ride orientated, that's part of our black ops range. Race, it's the, the, the hero sort of side of things. Um, so if you're looking for a, a, a good old mountain ski for a guy, as a progressive intermediate again, looking to sort of step the confidence level up, I'd put you on something like an Experience 80. Uh, so an Experience 80, it's got a, a, a blend of lots of camber underneath the foot. So we're gonna get still a lot of piece performance. It's got about a 30% sort of tip rise rocker on it as well. So it's going to allow you to sort of get the ski floating if you're getting into the more varied terrain or in the deeper snow. It's going to really sort of allow you to build your confidence on that side as well. I think one of the, one of the secrets that we use on this as well, this is something that Rosignol developed quite a number of years ago, <laughs> is uh, you'll, you'll see on all brands now, you have a, a thing, we call them semi-sidewall. So you'll, you'll notice that Underneath the middle section of the ski, it's got vertical sidewalls. And then you'll notice as you get more towards the extremities of the skis, it goes to more what we class as a cap type ski. So it's slanted sort of at the tip and also at the tail. There's a very simple reason why a brand does that, okay? Because as a, 
uh, an entry level skier or a progressive intermediate, you're not always tipping your skis over onto the edge and you're not always carving. The first movement that you're probably going to learn is to actually pivot and rotate and be able to slide and skid your feet around like that. So anything that's got a cap on it makes it very easy to skid and sort of pivot. Anything that's got a vertical sidewall under the foot gives you power, precision and performance. That's where you can put your, your foot on the gas and get the edge gripping and steering sort of under, underneath it. So anytime you see a ski on a rack, again, whether it be a Rosignol, whether it be an Atomic, whether it be a Salomon, whether it be a Hair, the Vocal, anything like that, when you see that semi-sidewall, vertical under the foot, but then it's slanted at the tips and the tails, you know that that's going to be a progressive intermediate type ski. Um, you mix that with an all mountain type camber, bit of camber, bit of tip rocker, bingo, off you go. So again, in a long way from our side, experience aim all day long. Great width, um, you know, nice and responsive sort of on piece, but still wide enough to give you some flotation and the deeper stuff to play around in as well. Get your confidence going. Perfect. Excellent. Cheers, Chris. Um, the next question is reference boots. Um, could you recommend a, a ladies intermediate or a ladies expert boot? Very much so. Um, when it comes to boots, um, again, I, I take my brand hat off here. Um, boots is very much about getting into a specialist store. Um, speaking with somebody in there, the first thing that they'll do is they'll take your, take your, um, your socks off, they'll have a good look at your feet. Um, and then they'll be able to look just from that simple assessment, they'll be able to maybe in their head work out three brands, three models of boot that's going to work sort of straight away for you. They'll take a few measurements like the width of your foot. That's what we call the last of the last of the boot. Um, and then start pulling some stuff out and going from there. I then take it to two different levels. Um, I then have what I would class as the classic two week a year holiday skier. Um, and the question I would put back to anybody out there as a classic two week a year holiday skier, what's the one thing that they want from their ski boots? Comfort. All day long. They're not, in, not bothered about the performance. They're not bothered about the color. They're not bothered about the price. It's comfort. It's something that they can get on their feet and go away and have a ball on the holiday for two weeks. You know, they'll have their two hours in the morning. They'll have their long lunch and a big bowl of pasta at whatever time, two hours in the afternoon, and then they're dancing on the tables in an evening, probably still with their ski boots on. For that, I would aim you towards, from our range, something like an all-track boot, which has got the ski height mode on the back. It's a perfect sort of blend for that. And we've got lots of different lasts. You've then got the other type of skier, who's the one that's had their couple of weeks holiday, but like I said at the, at, the, at the start, I'm suckered by the sport. I want to live and breathe it now. I want to be doing it all the time. I want to be out there having coaching on a regular basis. I'm probably going to be at the, the snow dog two or three times a week. You know, every holiday I can, I'm out there. I'm going on Ali's ski definition courses every sort of week to really try and sort, you know, get the most out of it. They need a bit more of a technical fit and boot. Um, so again, you want something that's maybe a little bit more, you could have maybe something that's got a um, customizable liner. Um, so that can give a little bit more closeness of fit. It might mean that we need to have a, a little bit of a stiffer flex of the boot. And the flex is basically an index which goes from around about 50 up to about 170. 170 is the stiffest, 50 is the softest. Um, but again, as the general rule of thumb is as we get more experienced, we want to have a stiffer boot so we can get more responsiveness out of the ski. However, the contra to that is you could have a guy that's never been skiing before, uh, that's an ex-rugby player, he's eight foot tall, he's built like a man mountain, that comes in, there you go. We don't want to put him on a low flexing boot because just because of his body morphology and everything else, if we put him on an 80 flex and entry level product, he'd snap his knees in two as soon as he steps onto it. So he may need a 130 flex boot in the widest last possible, just because of his shape and size, even though he's a beginner. 
So there's lots of different rules and permutations when it comes to boots. There's no hard and fast rule. So I go right back to the start, go on to a recommended sort of um, boot fitter. There's loads of them all over the country. Um, seek some expert advice and they'll tell you exactly what you need from them. Um, one thing I would say, and this is always not just um, an additional sale from the shop, invest in a good orthotic footbed as well, because that is makes makes a massive difference. And I'm sure you'd sort of back that up uh, along with sort of a lot of people out there as well. So. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go along with the definitely get to a, a ski shop. We mentioned it last week as well. Um, get into an expert, speak with them, find out what works best. And yeah, foot, footbeds, I, I think it's essential. I think ev every everyone that skis regularly does have a footbed these days. If they don't, then yeah, look at, look at getting a footbed. It's a, it's a necessity. Um, I've, I'm just going to go to the chat, <clears throat> chat Chris, because I've just had a, some questions come in. I'm just going to um, uh, go through these. Um, so first off, Jez Dodd, um, he's, I think he shared the, the link to the video you were trying to play. He's put that in the chat. Oh, well, brilliant. Want to have a look at that? That's in there. Um, then just in case, uh, I have a pair of Rosy Hero multi-turns, <clears throat> the CA ones. They are just a bit light when going at speed. Are the TI version noticeably stiffer? And do they have a different binding? Can't work it out from the website. Yeah, so the, 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 the simple answer is yes, they, they do. What you have on the, um, as, soon, as soon as you mention the word TI, which for some brands is titanol or titanium, as soon as you hear that word mentioned in any ski, I think of the three Ps, power, performance, and precision all the time. Um, if it's a carbon construction or a basalt, it generally tends to be a little bit softer and a little bit more forgiving. Uh, so if you want to beef up and put a little bit more in your turns, I definitely opt for the TI version. Uh, the binding setup isn't as critical on, on that. It's more about what we're actually putting in in terms of the laminates of the skis. So if you wanted something a little bit beefier, uh, I'd go for the, the, the TI. Yeah, for sure. Or um, in, in, that, in that range of the, the Hero skis, um, we've then got a Hero uh, Elite ST, which stands for short term, obviously. There's an LT, which is the long term version. And one of my favorite skis out of the entire range is we call it an Elite Plus. So it takes the short term ski, which is normally a 68 millimeter waist, and it expands it out by 10 millimeters to 78 but keeps exactly the same profile right the way through. So you've got a slalom ski in almost like an all mountain type mold. So as an instructor ski for something that'll ski the bumps well, loads of beef, the Elite Plus for me is a winner all day long. Yeah. And there's more and more of the brands doing similar things where they're just taking a, an SL construction, making it a little bit wider and just keeping the geometry the same throughout the ski. So, yeah. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Chris. Um, the next question is, as a person looking to finish my level three teach and tech, what ski do you recommend? That's from Hussein. I think I've just I've probably answered it there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, the Elite Plus. Um, Chris, just, just said, throw into that. I just throw that uh, the, uh, there is a, IASI does have a recommended radius these days as well, which starts to affect uh -huh. the Elite Plus and, and the ST. Uh, yeah. selection so i think it's 15 maybe for women and 16 for men that yeah. kind of ballpark and up so just to kind of throw that in there as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so on the elite plus again depending on sort of what length you're getting into uh you're going to be around about a 15 meter radius in a 172 length on that um it's, it's 14 in the 174 on the elite plus uh, yeah so it's it's a, a a little bit too short for what you're doing if that was if that was the case, probably you're you're better off with something like a, an experience or um, even getting into one of the sets that sort of Mark's got nicely nicely tucked away behind him there. Uh, getting into a set of the master skis, um, the master skis essentially what we're doing there is we take a um, a, a full on race ski, but take away all of the regulations that FIS apply on race skis. 
um, to get a, a GS ray scheme, but we can put it to suit whatever radius we want. So for this year's range, we've got uh, ones that are coming out at 16, 18, 21, 23, and 27 meter radiuses. So um, that would probably that would probably work sort of quite well on the ISIA stuff as well. Then. Uh, in your in your in your in the one six nine six sixteen meter very much so yeah you're oh. actually a little off there Chris they changed it this year it's it's fifteen uh, fifteen fifteen on, on the one six nine yeah it, it's the new radius this year yeah, on the new, uh, yeah he, he's trying to catch you out now Chris he's, he's, he's trying to get he's you good <laughs> <laughs> um just just to sort of add on to um so for Pam and for Huss that have mentioned it and I know they're they're both looking at exams um don't be too caught up in the, the the meter radius type turn um because you're not going to have an examiner walk back up the hill with a tape measure and start measuring the um the turn shape itself as well so don't be too caught in that you, you want a ski that is going to be able to perform a long and short turn um but don't get too much into the thought process of it needs to be a 16.5 radius and someone's going to go and look at you know just just as long as it's within that range and as long as you've got the skill and ability to adapt at a level three level four standard that's what we're looking for is someone that can achieve those long and short turns on a similar ski okay so i'd, I'd just... like to add if i if i may i mean one of the things that is relevant to a ski radius is of course the more you bend it the more it's going to turn. So you have to be aware that you might get a 15 meter radius ski that's extremely stiff or an 18 meter radius ski that's extremely soft. So you'll still get the required radius out of the ski. If you get a ski that's too stiff or too soft, then that's going to affect the, the ski. The, the ski will turn as much as you bend it. So if you're a big, strong, heavy skier and you're on a soft ski, then you're going to have, and vice versa, you're going to have adverse effects. So that's why testing skis is so good. Yeah, definitely, definitely, completely agree. Thanks, Scott. Um, I've just got another question in here from. Uh, you're very popular this week, Chris. Um, uh, I currently have the Hero um, Elite MT in a one five nine, and I am five foot six tall. I am considering the larger one six seven, but not not sure. Uh, not sure if these would be too long. What are your thoughts, or would the Elite Plus be a better option? Possibly, yeah. Ski, ski length is another one of those classic ones now where <clears throat> everybody for a number of years has said, you know, you need to have an old mountain ski at sort of this height to there or, you know, 15 centimetres below your head height for such and such or above your head height. I don't think any of those rules apply now. You know, I think, again, it goes back to testing skis uh, or somebody's recommendation. Um I, I, for instance, for me, if I go out on a, um, a set of the, the short turn skis, I love going out on the 160 because in a 160, it's really nimble. You can throw it around all over the place. It's still nice and grippy. But I'm not the lightest of guys. I'm 15 stone, you know, on a 160 set of skis, but it still works really well. It's still nice and stable for me. Um, but again, we're all different. It goes back to that bit where if you can try the ski out, fantastic. Um, it gives you an idea and a flavour of what it's about there. In the in the multi-turn, in the elite multi-turn, uh, it didn't it didn't say whether it was again, whether it was the carbon or the titanium version. Um, if it if it was the if it was the carbon version and you find and find it a little bit soft, again going up to the 167 might be a better option, or just upgrade into either the titanium version or going into that elite plus option that we mentioned earlier on uh yeah yeah ju just to throw in some two cents on on ski lengths and i think this backs up what you're saying there chris as well I, i'm i'm not a particularly tall person i probably stand at about 163 to 165 centimeters depending on uh, how well i slept uh, for, for my back i guess yeah. um the shortest pair of skis i think i ski on right now on a mountain is Maybe this one behind me in the 173. Uh, I think my experience 90, actually, no, my experience 94 is a 172. Um, and I actually, the first time I skied that was in the 180 or 188, and I loved that. Uh, uh, the, then I've got this in the 173 behind me. I've got the Elite Plus actually in a 174. 
because uh, I wanted the 14 meter radius and, and I absolutely do have to work harder if I want to slide it compared yeah. to the sh shorter length, but I'm willing to do that. I, I'm willing to say, well, I, I, I need to have a better ability to turn my legs and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna be willing to work harder. But there's nothing wrong with saying, well, actually, I don't want to have to work that hard either out on the hill and say, I'll go with this shorter length. It really depends on what your purposes are and what your reasons are and what you're willing to, to put into it and do on it as well. Yeah, very much right so. In there. But I, I, I do, I do just, to, just to leave it, it's, it's a funny thing when people say that a ski, is, is it too long? I mean, when you look at, if you, if you have to go and train for a, for a GS race, you're automatically going to have to be on a ski that's up here. And I definitely recommend you train on it and learn to ski on it in a variety of turns and situations. Uh, I, I think the, this idea of a ski being too long is, yeah, it kind of needs to go the way of the dodo a little bit. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, what what I'll what I'll do, Chris, is I've, I've got one last little message come in here from um, John Greenwood, and then oh, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll let we'll let the pressure drop from you because you've been going now for almost fifty minutes. Um, so John Greenwood has said, next time Chris comes up, uh, back up home, is he going to pop into Silksworth for a little cuppa? Fact. <laughs> there, there, there you go, John. You've, you've, yeah. got, you've got your answer. Um, if oh, anyone... Go on, can sorry. I one more? Yeah, go on. Sorry, Chris. I, I, and, and, and I'll maybe keep this one a little bit shorter. The, the experience range, obviously, it's going to be new for next year, and you don't have to get into that today. That'd be a, a long one. But... Uh, the current experience range has that like air tick technology and it brought in some of that soul seven and sky seven technology. Yeah. And before yeah. that, uh, it, it was on the outside of things looks more similar to, to, to the way it is now. The, the way I kind of saw that is that old experience range before the current one, that was a ski that the instructors absolutely loved. It was a one ski quiver uh, and, and they loved the performance side of it, but they also loved that it was wide enough that it could do any conditions. And this was, this was Western Canada. And, and I know people that loved it so much that when um, when it changed to when the experience range changed to, the, to its current format, they went down to shops and bought the old experience range on sale and bought like yeah. two pairs of them. Where, where does the new one fit in um, along that kind of scale? It, it goes back to more of where its roots was. And I think I think it's very valid point that because, again, I'm big enough and bad enough to admit this what they experimented with when they changed to the new experience, they went to a thing called an HD call. Uh, the HD wasn't using wood as we've always been associated with. Uh, it was using this new technology that they developed in the, in the factory down in Solange. It's not, a, it's not an injection process or it's not a foam that would go into a ski. It was multi-layered, but it came as almost like a, a sheet of a foam call. Personally for me, when that was introduced, the ski felt it wasn't as lively and it wasn't as responsive as we get from a normal wood core ski. So that's the first thing that's happened in the new skis. We've gone back into using a poplar wood core uh, or a polonia wood core, depending on what the model is. Um, that's a key thing. The, the other thing as well, you, you were saying about the air tip um, and we've experimented with all sorts of things over the years, but. You'll always heard of Rosignol talk about VAS, V-A-S, which always stood for Vibration Absorption System. Um, many moons ago, when we had the likes of the 4S or the 7S or anything like that, a VAS was basically a plate that was stuck onto the top of the ski. But what VAS actually is, it's a viscoelastic material, which has got wire threads that run through it. And when the skis flex, um, the, the, the metal heats up, but it also works in conjunction with the viscoelastic. So it allows all of the, um, the, the vibrations that we get from it, coming through the ski to dissipate and move away. Um, you'll have seen that in some of our race skis where we're using things now called prop tech technology, where we're actually splitting the core of the ski into two halves, sometimes now even three halves, and putting these layers of viscoelastic down. But what's happened this time is we've put a, a big internal layer of uh, this viscoelastic rubber at the front part of the ski, which basically uh, comes all the way back to the front part of the, the binding, and it's called dry tip. And essentially what happens is as soon as we, we, we start to turn off and we start to see that or feel the ski starting to chatter, the dry tip and the viscoelastic absorbs a lot of those vibrations and just keeps us nice and clean 
and smooth on sort of the edge of the ski. So again, it's trying to give us a more comfortable and predictable sort of ride. Um, these are all, sorry, I don't want to go on too long about this. These are all things that have uh, evolved again from not just race department, but they'll have come from snowboard and all, all other places as well. And one, if you were watching the World Championships last week, you'd have seen a lot of the girls, Pepper Vahova were using it, Tessa Volley was using it. Uh, we've got on the GS skis, there's a big piston that's attached to the front part of the tip of the, uh, tip of the ski and also onto the binding as well. Uh, and that's a thing called DLC, direct line control technology. And if you watch a GS ski in like full on turns, as, as awesome as they are at the speed that they're going at, they get all of these chatters and the skis are losing sort of the line. And the idea about putting this piston on is to keep that ski as clean as it can on the edge to eliminate any of that sort of sideward drift, which keeps it a cleaner line, smoother line, faster line, ultimately better performance. So we're trying to take those ideas and concepts and build them into more commercial products. And that's again, utilizing this viscoelastic drive tip. Yeah, so massive difference. It's back to what experience really was. But uh, uh, the uh, only thing- Am I right the only saying then, sorry, I'll, I'll keep going. Now, the only thing I was a little bit disappointed with uh, because it was almost their 30th anniversary of sort of when Bandit, Bandit started I thought it would have been a perfect opportunity to reintroduce it as a new bandit series, but uh, maybe next time. Yeah, it, it, I kind of look at it and it just looks like um, bringing back the, the on-mountain performance and fun and zip of the old experience while also keeping the, the damping and the, and the suspension at the tip from, from the new yeah. experience as well. Yeah, very much. And what we're trying to do as well is, um, you know, everybody's used this term all mountain for however long. We're, we're trying to utilize more the terminology of a resort or an, a resort ski. So the resort ski, um, you can still go into varied terrain, the bumps, you can be all over the place. And it's that one ski equipment that does a bit of everything sort of all over the place, uh, rather than it just being a react ski, which is predominantly 100% for use on the piece. So it's that one ski does a bit of everything. So. Oh. Um, Chris, I'm just going to ask you one last quick one. Um, yeah, I've just had I will be quick. Um, Susan, um, what would be the difference between the skier you would put on a Nova 6 or a Hero range? Um, that's, a, that's a good question because it, it, the, the standard one would be, the standard one to say would be ability and uh, uh, technical ability. However, that's not necessarily the case because it could be their aspirations. They, they might be an over six skier at one point, but they've got so much determination that they want to go out. They're, they're going to be a hero skier. So, you know, we could put them onto something and they go out and they, they have a ball on that. It depends on what your aspirations are from the mountain. If you want a ski that's going to be comfortable, cruisy, give you lots of confidence in getting the feeling of your edge, you know, giving you the best thrills when you're out there just on your two week a year holiday, Nova six all day long. If you want something that's going to go out there, you're going to stick loads of effort in, you know, really work the ski hard and you want to get lots of sensations coming back from it. Be prepared sometimes for maybe not the smoothest of rides because it's going to work you back and throw you around all over the place. You're up all day long. Perfect. Perfect. I'm, I'm going to leave it there because I'm sure some of these questions could keep keep coming in and going going uh, for hey, hours, mate. But um, if, 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 there's, if there's more, Ali, please fire them through. I'll do more than I'll be more than happy to answer them by email and stuff. That's not, yeah. that's not what, what I was going to suggest was if, if there is any more questions for Chris, I can fire them through um, to Chris on an email and um, we can get them messages back to people. Um, the presentation or the videos that we're going to show, is it is it possible if you could send me the links that I could then get them out to the client yet? Okay, so very, I'll get... very very much so. And there was there was a one I was going to show originally, which is a brilliant one. It's a it's a twelve minute view, and it's called uh, it was done a few years ago. It's called the hundred and twelve years history of Rosignol, and you can find that it's just on YouTube. Uh, okay. But it literally starts right off from where we started with Abel Rosignol and, you know, doing everything, but all the way through to like the Tomba days, you know, current days, Bruno Circle, everything as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good view that one. Yeah. Yeah, cool. We'll, 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 we'll get them out for you and um, people can then have a look at their, their heart of content for that one. So um, brilliant. Thank you, Chris. I really no, appreciate it. No worries. Thanks for your time, everybody.
And um, yeah, feel, feel free if you want to stay on. If you need to jump off, then um, yeah, obviously feel free to do that as well, mate. So, but really no, appreciate I'm, your time. I'm going to stay on. I'm going to get a coffee and then uh, I'll come back and have a listen. Perfect. Nice one. Take Thanks, care, everybody. Brilliant. Cheers, Chris. You're a legend. Catch up with you soon at some point, hopefully. Um, Take care, pal. Perfect. So um, what we're going to do now is <clears throat> um, I think we're going to move on to Mark. Are you, you ready to do your your session um we'll do mark and then we go on to ian you you call with that ian is that fine perfect top man so um, i'll let yeah, mark I, introduce yeah, I, and go with it yeah i think if we hadn't stopped talking to chris I, I myself probably had about another half dozen questions i, I could have asked like uh for me between the react range and the and the hero range you know where would you make that switch you know, a million yeah. questions um, i'll arrange a private chat for you and chris so you can oh, talk no, no, no needs. I'll, I'll just skip you a bunch of questions <laughs> just so people know i i've i've been riding on rosniel from out in canada for um for well, i don't know three or four years now i switched from head to rosniel um it ended up being one of the best things i ever did and not not because one's better than the other but just that that change i think was was really fun so um I, there's a lot of the range that i have skied on from rosniel and and from head uh, if people are interested, I might be able to answer some of those questions, though certainly not to the kind of level of depth that someone like Chris and, and Matt can answer as well. Anyway, um, I thought we'd get started on, on some bumps talk. You guys in the first uh, in the first week there mentioned that you'd like to chat about bumps and, and things like that. So I thought we'd start from from the bare bones this week and then and then build it up next week. Um, um, and I'm trying to aim to do this in a way that A, means you guys don't have to listen to me talk very much, which is always a win. And uh, yeah, there's, there's Ali's celebration. And uh, also allows me to piggyback off other people's good work from some, from some videos I found on YouTube that I think are, are good. And when we watch the videos, I haven't chosen them for any specific, specific reason other than they literally popped up in my YouTube channel this week while I was looking and just recommended. And I thought they were some of the better ones that I've seen to kind of broach the subject. So um, I, I'm kind of looking at this at, at, at a starting point. If you kind of take that person that, that, that they're just starting out skiing bumps and maybe they're pretty comfortable on the groomed and then they, they feel like the moment they get into the bumps that their whole world falls apart. Every skill, every shred of skill that they have or thought they have falls apart the moment they get into bumps. Uh, and, and maybe there's a point here where some of you guys if that's not you right now, maybe you can kind of recognize that in some students you teach or, you know, maybe where you once were in the bumps. But I, I kind of look at that as, you know, the first thing you notice when you when you start skiing bumps is they just seem like these obstacles, these things getting in the way of you having a good time and, and getting from from where you are to the bottom of the hill. I think the second stage goes to where you you start to understand how to use the bumps to your advantage and what movements you can make inside them and, and where to do that. And then I think the, the third final stage is where you just see a playground out in front of you and, and you have options on how you get down them. So what we're going to do here is, as we start off, like I said, I'm going to let other people's hard work do the, uh, do the heavy lifting. Let's just make sure I bring up the right video. Uh, I think this is the one. I was looking for the Rosniel video earlier. So, uh, okay, close that one down. So let's start off uh, with this one. This is one from the CSI that they put out this season. And I think what this does is this just gives us a starting point of what might we consider to be good bump skiing from our point of view, from the point of view as a, as a recreational bump skier, skiing bumps on the mountain uh, that are created naturally um, versus like a competition bump skier. But we'll kind of discuss that as well uh, in a little bit here too. I just need to move my video. All right. Hopefully this plays smoothly.
Is everyone here still with me? All here, mate. All um, here. Good. So I just kind of thought I'll rattle through the, these few points because I, I, you know, these aren't the be all and end all and, and, and everything that we kind of, all these videos we watch, I think they kind of benefit from a little bit of extra discussion around it. So speed remains consistent. I, I don't just see that as, as being from the top of the run to the bottom of the run kind of deal. And this is like our, our, our pinnacle of, of bump skiing, but speed remaining consistent from bump to bump that it doesn't look like they every time they hit a bump that they slow down and then they speed up over the back and then they slow down when they hit the next bump is that it really looks like they flow from bump to bump and it remains pretty consistent i think that's that's pretty evident in a lot of the skiing in the video there um turn shape and line ad adjusted to terrain so when we ski naturally formed bumps they're not all perfectly round they're not all evenly spaced some are jagged some are close together some are far apart and that we adjust to that and, and, and what that kind of tends to mean is if I've got to throw in a couple of quick turns to go in through the rut line and a couple of jagged ones, I'll do it. By the same token, if I end up in this big wide open space in between bumps, I need to decide whether or not I throw in two or three turns in that space, or do I throw in one big long one to then go to the next bump? Uh, and, and I think if you watch the video, the video again, that there isn't really a moment there with any of those guys where it doesn't look like they're the ones in control over their line. The terrain never really looks like it's telling them where to go, but they are adjusting to the terrain. And that kind of falls right back into, into the next one there. Skills blended to produce an overall full line run. So regardless of, of the size turn they end up making and the rate at which they make those, those turns, overall it stays consistently in the full line. Uh, and I kind of translate that most to that they're always turning to adjust line and to change where they're going. They're never traversing to shop for a new line. Um, that, that's kind of the simple way that I look at that. Uh, snow contact is controlled at will. You know, we, we kind of often teach bumps that, you know, the main big goal there is to keep the skis glued to the ground. It, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be the be all and end all. And, and when we watch that video, yeah, there's the big fancy moment where the guy airs off of one bump and lands, you know, over the back of another. If you watch the video closely, you're going to see other points where the skis are in, in the air. And it's not because they're getting tossed around. Um, it, if you kind of look at it, it's almost like sometimes it's like they're, if you were running across a, a, a stream or something like that, that had like stepping stones on it and you would jump from one stepping stone to the next. Sometimes that's how it looks like their skis are in the air. Like they're just kind of coming off of one stepping stone and they're hopping and almost landing on the next stepping stone and they're just placing their feet from bump to bump and where they need to get to. And that's, that's always controlled. So whether their skis are on the ground or off the ground, uh, tip and tail, horse ski, whatever, it's, it's always a controlled and decided kind of element. So with that in mind, I think those are kind of some elements that we can aspire to in bumps. And those are things that we can gauge our success by. Um, because as we kind of look at some of these other videos, I, I think you're, we'll probably end up um, comparing it or, or keeping it in relation to, uh, you know, that whole learning versus performance kind of idea. Uh, but those are kind of some things there. So these are, these are some other videos that we'll get into. I'm kind of playing some of these videos out of order because I thought it would be better suit our, our kind of ideals. So I might skip some of these uh, bits of these videos as well because like the first intro bits are sometimes a bit of just fluff. Um, Kind of going in, but let's let's just jump in here and watch these videos. Uh, this one I'm going to skip a little bit. Terrain. Our next few sessions will focus on applying a few simple tactics to develop efficiency within our bump skiing technique. Having said that, from this point forward, it is important to choose terrain which is within the boundaries of your personal skill set. And for those of you who are new to bump skiing. 
This should consist of small, round moguls, which are well spaced on a moderate pitch, as this type of terrain will offer the largest variation of line choice and give you the best chance for fast progression. However, before we even venture into the smallest of bump runs, we first need to check off a couple of key technical requirements while skiing on groomed terrain. Firstly, we must develop versatility within our skiing through a range of different turn sizes. After all, moguls come in different sizes, and it's important that we're able to adapt our turn size to fit well with the terrain before us. Secondly, we need to develop a consistency within our turn shape. That is to say, each and every turn, regardless of its size, should be full, round, and connected directly to the turn beneath it. It's safe to say that once you're able to adapt a variety of turn sizes while maintaining good shape, then you're ready to tackle the bumps. So here we are on a well-groomed, moderately steep pitch, and I'm going to ski down here with a focus on creating good turn shape. One thing that can really help with this is if I begin my run by visualizing the fall line. That is the imaginary line which represents the path of least resistance straight down the mountain. And during this session, it will become the point against which I measure how round and complete I'm able to make each of my turns. Okay, start off by making some medium turns at moderate speed. As you start to establish your rhythm, begin to cast your focus on the fall line. Your goal now is to complete each turn to the point where you're able to cut across the hill at a 90 degree angle to the fall line itself. This is harder than it looks and will often require a strong and committed effort to turn your skis further and for much longer through the turn than you may be used to. The good news is the more effort you place into the end of each turn, the less effort that is needed to begin the next. This concept will become a key factor in determining how quickly you're able to transition from turn to turn and the type of bumps you'll ultimately be able to ski. Okay, there you have it. Get out there on some groomed terrain and practice skiing with good turn shape. Because next time you see me, we'll be taking these concepts and applying them directly into the moguls. This has been Guy Hetherington for All Tracks Academy, coming to you with more online ski training. Have a great season out there. All right. So that probably won't come as, as too much of a surprise in terms of the information there, in terms of we want to have some preparation before we go to the bumps to kind of make sure that we've got, you know, a reasonable skill set bef before we go there. Um, because when what really happens in the bumps when we get into that situation where we feel like everything's fallen apart what tends to be the case is that the skill set that we have essentially isn't robust enough to hold up under the pressure of bumps that's what bumps are doing it's an extra challenge it's added pressure and so when our bumps fall apart when we when we kind of go back to that learning versus performance kind of ideal that learning is, is measured by retention and transfer what's really going on here is we're struggling to transfer our skill set into this different situation because it's more challenging and so i'm going to add to to some of the stuff that guy has, has mentioned there in his video in the he kind of i i, I don't think it's it's a, a way out there concept to say that we want to be able to make a a short turn to consider being able to make a short turn in the bumps and that's something we need to go and practice um, I, I think it's worthwhile saying, though, that, yeah, practice a variety of turn sizes. Um, he he kind of mentions that we want that turn shape to be round all the time. If I take it back a stage to when we're trying to develop those turning skills to be ready for the bumps that we can control our speed, we, it, we maybe don't necessarily need to have it round all the time. Um, for example, I, I might want to consider being able to make a turn size that's no wider than the actual length of my skis. So, you know, if you if your skis, these ones here behind me, 173 centimeters long, if I stand facing across the hill, that's the size of my corridor that I'm now gonna try and stay in, okay? Um, and that kind of takes us towards um, towards something like a, a bricage is, is, is that kind of exercise. That's the way I look at bricage is what I'm trying to do is keep my, ski, uh, my feet and the center of my skis sliding down the full line while, uh, while my skis turn all the way around from one side to the next. 
Um, I'm not necessarily going to watch the the bricage video here. We'll, we'll kind of see what kind of time we've taken up. Um, but hopefully that makes sense so far. In the yes, we want to be able to make a variety of size turns, but also do them in a variety of kind uh, kind of ways so that we have some choice when we get into the bumps in terms of our, our turning effort based on the terrain that's in front of us. That kind of relates to that, um, you know, adjusting to terrain. So that's part of what we can do. And we can do that in the snow dome, right? We can get into the snow dome and practice these shorter turn sizes. We can practice and develop our ability to turn our legs to ski narrow corridors. And you can also develop the rate at which you do that. And what I mean by that, bricage doesn't necessarily need to be this fast thing in terms of how quickly you're turning your legs initially, but maybe you want it to build up to really being able to turn your legs very quickly and ski that narrow corridor. Um, so I'll move on to the next one because I think this, this then also takes us into how we, how we can practice timing of other movements differently outside of the bumps in order to be prepared for the bumps as well. Um, and, and he kind of shows how he uses some other terrain uh, in resort as well. Watch this whole one. Guy Hetherington here again for All Tracks Academy with some more ideas on how to improve your free ski. Today we'll be taking a detailed look at what is arguably one of the most important moves in all of skiing. So let's check it out. When we get to the stage where we're looking to increase the speed of our off-piece skiing, we need to be prepared to deal with varying degrees of terrain undulation. The faster we go in bumpy or undulating terrain, the faster the ground will appear to rise and fall beneath our feet. And how we deal with this idea is a major key to entering into the advanced or expert realm. So let's take a look at how this can play out in a simple straight run before we put it into our turns. So here we are at one of Whistle Blackcomb's terrain-based learning centers. And I'm gonna perform a straight run through a few of these man-made rollers. Notice how I approached the first roller in a very tall and upright position, but then allow the roller to push my legs up towards my chest as I pass over it. The ultimate goal is to absorb a series of these rollers entirely with our legs, while our head remains as level as possible throughout its journey. If your resort does not provide terrain features like this, go out and find yourself a natural roller to practice this move upon. Once you are comfortable allowing your body to compress from the ground upwards, take this move onto the groomers and place it in between some turns. But now, instead of the terrain forcing your feet up towards you, let the pressure of the turn do exactly the same thing. The timing of your compression is critical here. Notice how I'm in my most compact position directly between one turn and the next, as my skis are completely flat to the snow. It is only as the new turn begins that I allow my legs to extend out to the side. So take that and work on it for a while. Once you have it down, come back for part two of this video, where I'll show you how to apply this move in the bumps and over a variety of different terrain scenarios. Okay. Let's pause that. Yeah, pause. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Let's just scroll, scroll back. Okay. Guy Hetherington here again for All Tracks Academy yeah. with some more ideas sorry, on how have, to improve your free ski. Still playing? Today we'll be. Okay. All right. So I, I'm hoping that doesn't necessarily um, come out of left field to anyone that's, that's hoping to aspire to, to ski bumps better in that that probably sets us on two kind of movement priorities, which would be our ability to turn our legs uh, in a you know, very strong fashion, independent of our, of our upper body, so that we can turn them all the way across the fall line to control our speed and that we can turn them quickly enough and forcefully enough that we can ski in a, in a tight corridor. Uh, I, I think the addition to that would be that we can make uh, as many of those turns in as tight a vertical distance down the hill as possible as well. That would be kind of how I would gauge my success with regards to my ability to turn, uh, turn my legs. Um, and you can do that in a snow dome, give yourself blocks and, and give yourself uh, 
10 meters or, or between a few pylons, something where you can literally measure the distance and say, right, I just want to do as many turns as I possibly can within that distance, okay? Uh, that, that's one way of doing it. Now, obviously, if you can get someone or you get there early enough that you can also measure your, the width of your turn in between the grooming tracks, when you can actually see them early in the day, that's what's gonna allow you to then look at your tracks or as you ski down the hill, determine how wide your path is to, to understand if you, if you have any drift forwards or backwards in your skiing, okay? Um, and obviously the, the, the count there of how many turns you do, that's, you know, that we then start to kind of really challenge our ability to do it, do it as quickly as possible. With regards to the flexion and extension, I, I look at that as we, we can probably all picture and imagine that going into bumps. And we're gonna look at that next week where we look at how these things and elements apply into the bumps, as well as what to look at and line and, and, and lines and that we can ski and take in the bumps next week as well. But this is all the starting point. So if I look at that and I want to say, well, what can we do here in this country to prepare for this? It tends to be that we need to have the ability to time our flexion and extension movements differently than we might be used to doing on the groomed in order to prepare for the bumps. But by the same token, I think you can see in that video that that, that different timing can also be applied to performance skiing on the groomed as well. Okay, I'm hoping that that makes sense. So if I'm gonna kind of leave this as to before we get to the bumps, things that we can do to start preparing is we wanna be able to make a variety of times turn sizes on a variety of slopes. And that's a variety of steepness of slopes, right? Makes, fair, makes sense, right? Um, skiing on a steeper slope is going to challenge your ability to complete the turn more, to turn your skis all the way across the hill. But by the same token, doing that on a flatter pitch is also going to make that challenging in terms of your balance as well, um, because you're not going to have speed and forces to keep you standing up there. Uh, so it, 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 it's worthwhile doing on, on flatter terrain as it is on steeper terrain. But um, if we're lucky enough to ski these indoor snow domes while they or, you know, an artificial slopes are probably even more ideal in terms of outdoor uh, dry slopes. But the indoor snow domes, when we know when they get, when the snow gets churned up at the end of the day, just adds to the challenge. It's not always going to be ideal uh, situation out there. So it's, it's worthwhile um, playing about with these things all the time. Uh, the second one, does it always have to be round? While we're learning, while we're practicing and developing these movements and skills, Round could be more of an end goal, end target in terms of trying to smooth uh, these skills out and our blending of these skills out. It doesn't necessarily have to be round right from the get go while we're, while we're learning these things. Uh, but it's, it's worthwhile that keeping the idea of a round turn shape in the back of your mind because it's one, one of the ways that we're gonna measure you know, our, our success or our outcome, as it were. Um, already said that one. And then, yeah, so challenge how tight you can make your turns and how quickly you can make them. It's a simple challenge inside the snow dome of just do as many turns as you can between point A and point B and then see how much more you can get. Um, you, can, you can challenge your, yourself with that one to try and beat yourself. But it's also, also worthwhile uh, seeing if you can get someone like, like Ali, uh, myself or, or anyone that's in, in one of your, your skiing facilities to go and set a benchmark for you, go and set the bar and see, see what they can do. And then if you get the chance to watch them doing it, watch relative to some of the things we've discussed here, you know, are they staying you know, in that really tight, narrow corridor? What kind of turn are they, are they making? Um, get yourself some video and things like that uh, of yourself doing it so you can do it relative to some of these benchmarks, all right? So that's really all I'm gonna say for this week. Um, I'll see if there are any kind of any, any other questions going on here uh, in a second, but that's I, I'm going to leave it there for this week in terms of things that we can do outside the bumps. I have also considered what we can do as dry land training for it as well. Oh, I, you know what? I, with regards to that, I will show one final video clip before I kind of end as a bit of inspiration and, and show you some other videos that you can go away and watch that are fun to watch. Um, but the funny thing is about this, if I go and do a squat, it's great for the movement, but the difference in bumps is it's the ground pushing up against you. And so your muscles actually contract a little bit differently and work a little bit differently when the ground is pushing up against you. And then when it falls away, when your leg extends, it, it's a different contraction compared to doing a squat and then pushing up against the ground in order to extend. So 
I'm trying to figure out good ways of, of applying that the diff the way that forces apply differently in bumps to dry land dry land stuff. So I'll see how clever I can be and what I can find to to kind of help with that a little bit more. Um, but here's here's one more video for you before I uh, before I just kind of go into some of the questions if I can find it again. Here we go. And this is uh, oh. Oh, I'm getting some funny things going on here. Yeah, we're getting this funny is, things going uh, on. Oh, yeah, okay. Hopefully this works now. Yeah, cool. This looks like Chris Best in the 80s. Way to go. Awesome. Pretty uh, nuts, I would, I would kind of bad. describe that. Give me some of that. Excuse maybe the awesome. language in it, but uh, anyway, there you go. Um, now, I'm not going to say that any of us, uh, except for maybe some of the younger ones, should be going out there and digging some holes in your local park to go and do that. Oh, yeah, Ali, is Taylor going to go and uh, push you into that one, is he? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think it just goes to show that you can you can be creative. We've probably seen some video footage of, of uh, dryland slalom skiers you know, sticking some poles in the ground and, and running around some slalom gates too. I, it, it can all help, but it all has to be within your limits. Um, other things that we can do, you know, would be uh, like getting a step or a box and doing jump drills up and onto the box, doing that laterally. So jumping from the side of the box up on and up to the side there, uh, but also jumping forwards and off the back as well, because there is a four aft component to bumps as well. So I, I'm going to play about with some stuff and see what more fun dryland things I can come up with, and um, uh, uh, and maybe try and make it applicable to all uh, physical abilities and skill levels and stuff like that. I can see Hussein uh, raising his finger. I have seen your your question here as well, but if you want to unmute yourself, feel free to to ask. You're muted there, Hussein. Well, you, you have, okay, just give me a thumbs up if you want. You're muted at the moment, Hussein. Can't hear you, Hussein. Find the mute button, bottom left. Now? There you go. Yeah, there Good you man. go. You know, you were saying look for an exercise where your legs go up and down. Would a trampoline be good for that? Maybe. So if you stand on a trampoline, you push down, your, your, it's only your lower part of your body that's going to go up and down. I, I, yeah, I don't know because, that. because the timing's still a little bit different because when you, when you land in compression, you're landing with a straight leg and resisting that compression. And then resisting that is then what then pushes you up afterwards. So I, it, I look at the end. It's the nearest thing I could find to land exercises. <laughs> Um, one, one thing you can do is, of course, if you can find a nice, long, mellow set of stairs just to jump down. Yeah. You know, I, that, that is something that, that you can work. That's what I've, I used to train on was a long set of stairs. I, I think the simple version of it, Hussein, is, is that you can try to approximate this as closely as possible in, in, on like dry land training, either on a static flat floor or on some kind of slope and you'll come close but never quite get there so i would say do as do as many different things as you can if you've got some stairs at home you know jump up them as well as down them you know every, every once in a while you know maybe no, I've, got, I've got a wife there's no way she's going to allow me jumping up and down stairs <laughs> mark mark i've I told you out if you're lucky mark i tell my sharks to go up and down uh, and i also told them uh, in, a, in a funny way i said try it with your boots on and the following day I got a phone call uh, from uh, some very angry parents saying how dare you tell my kids to jump up and down stairs on our 
<laughs> are wearing ski boots. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely correct. But it worked. It worked actually. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great stuff. You know what? And, and I saw um uh Tom Gelly put out another I don't I don't know if it was an old video or a new video, I can't remember now, but he put out one where he was trying to he was basically trying to understand the movement of how uh, elite mogul skiers get their hips forwards over a bump. And the way that he did it indoors on a dry slope with his shoes on is he replicated the movement when he, when he compared what he was doing to a video. But in reality, it's very, very different when you're going down a slope over terrain uh, with skis on, even though the two things look the same. But it, but it was very interesting to watch, and I think it is worth approximating that um just to answer your question as well that is this level three or level four bump standard D did you mean the csia video that i showed um it wasn't it wasn't a specific standard it was just what they're putting out towards bump skiing how does that compare to the isia um level three level four bumps well oh, it doesn't well those guys those guys in the video uh, are all level four skiers um i'm 99 certain on that so but if I was looking at a level three skier, you're looking at all of those same components, probably at a slightly slower speed and in slightly easier terrain. And so level three CSIA, <laughs> and just so you know, level three CSIA is still, um, is still ISIA standard from a technical point of view, but you don't get your ISIA at CSI level three unless you go out and do all the other CSIA requirements. And, 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 and ISI requirements, you know, means the first aid, it means uh, the, the dual certification, it means the second language. Um, but it also, uh, ISI standard also has a time spent on national course training. And at the moment within the CSIA, you don't have enough time or hours spent after completing your level three, if you just go all the way through of national training. What it used to be was if you complete your level three and then were to take the level four course, you would have had enough time on a national course training with all the other ISI components that your level three standard and all this other stuff is ISIA. So what you're seeing in the video there is, I'd say that in terms of putting a score to that, you're looking at level four. Um, That's good. Yeah, they make it look pretty easy, hey? Uh, <laughs> And but by the same token, um, it's the same components, but the the nature of the terrain and the speeds that you have to go at is is advanced, whereas what we just looked at there is more expert. Yeah, that, that's the way the CSI defines it as well. Anyway, level three is all advanced speeds, advanced terrain and level four is expert and expert terrain. Uh, what other videos we've got jumping on and off Bosu ball. Yeah, I, I want to play about with the Bosu, Bosu ball stuff a little bit more. I think there's definitely some fun that we can have there. I've got one literally two feet in front of me right now. Sorry, I just make this one point just quickly whilst you're on that and also kind of following on from Hussein's point before when you're talking about the trampoline and things like that in terms of the similar sort of movements and things, you would get it. The only way you would be able to kind of match the movement in terms of skiing across the uh, the mogul or the bump or whatever would be if you if you had constant contact with the with the mat with the trampoline mat. As soon as you as soon as you lose the contact with the mat, then you're going to get a different movement pattern. You would need to keep constant um, contact at all times. If that makes sense. So very clever, yeah. You'd be able to do it in terms of movements. Um, vertical movements but as soon as you put in some sort of lateral movement on a trampoline or something like that you're going to have to leave contact and then you would get a different movement pattern and also a different feeling of um pressure building up against you as opposed to um you know you know you're not going to get the pressure of the mogul pushing against you you're going to be making the pressure so it's a, it's a different feeling if you lose contact cool yeah very yeah very good john thanks for that um, just to go through some of the comments here. So great to see a female skier doing the business. It absolutely is. Uh, that's filmed in Whistler, that video, I believe, which, you know, being the biggest resort on the planet is home to a lot of, of Canada's best skiers. Um, certainly not the only location, but there are some fantastic um, uh, female and male skiers there that absolutely shred. Uh, certainly ones that I would uh, be doing well to keep up with, I think, on, 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 on good days. Um, the Bricage video is it's really easy to find if you want to find it. Uh, it's it's just on the CSIA's. Um, well, actually, if you just search, search uh, for the CSI bumps Vimeo, uh, they've got all of their stuff on Vimeo. 
Uh, I think that one is there, although th that's also on YouTube. If you just search CSIA Bricage, it, it will come straight up on YouTube. Um, and I've also put the CSI Hockey Stops one in there. They've put videos out on Bricage and Hockey Stops because that was, I don't think it still is, I could, but I don't necessarily know for certain, uh, it was one of the ski off uh, maneuvers or runs in the level four. They, they added in Bricage and Hockey Stops for a while to encourage steering uh, and, and some turning efforts of the lower body and to really direct skiers towards that. Because what they were seeing was a lot of skiers showing up on slalom skis and really relying on side cut and, and a lot of um, rotary movements of the upper body were creeping into skiing um, because they could get away with it on that kind of ski. So that's why they incorporated that. That's one of, it's one of, not the only, but it's also one of the reasons why IAZ and other associations also encourage a longer radius ski is to encourage development of those steering skills and that turning effort of the leg. Um, so hopefully that, that Bricage video is easy enough to find. Um, if I do put a separate edit together of, of this talk, I'm not sure if I can because I'm using other people's video. Uh, I can certainly include all of them. Um, what I might be able to do is just share the playlist that I've put together with all of you guys instead. Yeah, I was going to say, oh, if, you, if you give us the, the links, I, I can fire it out on an email, Mark. Yeah, I've saved it as a playlist, so I'll see if I can just um, share that playlist with people. I think I can. Uh, all right. Uh, yep, trampling the similar. I was on my old Rosie Experience 84 yesterday. It was a great ski. It absolutely uh, still is. I've, I came across a video of me on my old Experience 84 and some pictures recently. That thing, I kind of wish I still had it, to be honest with you. Like I said, I know some people that went down to the shops and bought two or three more pairs of them when they when they changed. It was a funny thing. I mean, Chris, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, but it was a funny thing out in Canada. The experience range was fantastically popular with a lot of instructors, but wasn't a great seller in a lot of the shops in our area, which is kind of why I thought that they might have been going with some of the changes initially. But Yeah, interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100 percent on that, but especially from the state side of things, the, the state makes up something ridiculous, like 38 percent of all of the global sales of everything that happens now on was the ski sales, well, all brands ski sales, they're massive. Um, so they have a massive, uh, massive part of what happens with the development. Um, but yeah, I think the, I think the one that was definitely put into a lot of the stores out there was the Soul 7. At the, um, you could just see black and black and yellow everywhere all over the point at that time. Oh my God. Yeah, absolutely. Being, uh, being in Western Canada, the Sky 7 and the Soul 7, um, you couldn't get your hat like if you didn't get a pair of those in the first month of the season you weren't getting your hands on any yeah. um uh, so, uh, yeah so jez has posted a link to uh to ski simulator.com um I, I i don't know if i'll be able to click that link and share it here so i'll let other people click on that if they want to have a look uh or let us know what that is but yeah i think so i think that's all for me hopefully that makes sense next week we're going to look at the extension which is it's just taking these movements and applying it into bumps and it's going to look at a couple of things one um that important move in skiing in terms of how we can continue to develop that outside of bumps, but also uh, applying it inside the bumps. And then we start to look at, well, what are we looking for when we ski bumps? What are our, what are our, what are our target points in terms of where we're trying to place our skis? And then also what are the different lines that we can take throughout the skis as well? I think if we know the movements that we, that we want to make and some ways in which we can go about practicing and developing them, if we have an idea of what we what we're looking at in the bumps in terms of where we want to to ski and place our ski to control ourselves and, and the path we want to take but then the last bit in terms of line is well how are we going to get to those points of the bumps as well that's that's essentially our three component stage and then i just think we need to um is our we'll just continue to get creative and share some ideas and more and more things we can do to to prepare ourselves getting ready for it before we ever get back on snow perfect Perfect. Um, excellent. Thank you, Mark. Much, uh, much appreciated. And um, thanks for the questions that Mark's posed. But as he said, he's going to he's going to expand on this next week and sort of take it an, a next step on. And um, yeah, continue sort of the bump theme and just sort of following on from what Mark said, some of the sort of key words and um, choice of uh, words that he put into his discussion there or his presentation, I should say. Um, as what John mentioned last week in his presentation, tactical versus um, tactics versus technical. And on the, the video that I showed with regards to the progression uh, about movements and um, a rounded turn shape, you can see how a lot of this stuff unintentionally, we've not even really talked about it, how some of these words are actually being brought into each of these sessions. And um, it's quite crucial that 
uh, you just sort of take note of some of the key words and preparation um, is key to a lot of this. As, as Mark said, you know, prepare before you go to attack the bumps or ski the bumps or even start to get in them. Prepare on piste and then go into the bumps themselves. And, you know, training in the UK on the dry slope or on the um, indoor centres is, is crucial. But vary what you're doing. Don't just do the same thing or don't try and just create the same thing over and over again. Um, change it. Do as many turns, wide turns, short turns, fast turns. Yes, Mark. Yeah, just, to, just, to throw, just to throw one more thing in. Um, yeah, Ali's talking about, I forgot to mention, obviously, you know, uh, the, the stuff that John mentioned last week is you're going you're gonna to see it in, in practice with how we approach a lot of the stuff. Also, if you do find yourself watching other videos, when you listen to myself, Ali, you know, whoever's, whoever's kind of giving you a presentation, if there's any words, terminology or language that you get hung up on in terms of you've heard it differently, someone else or someone explains it differently, please do ask us and let us know. Um, because I, I would hate for, for kind of terminology to get in the way of us all talking about the same thing, just using a different word or a different way. So uh, do always keep that in mind. Um, it's that, that old outage that maybe it's just two people saying the same thing in a different way. So if that's ever a problem, please mention it as, as quickly as possible and we'll, we'll kind of uh, address that. You could, you could tell in the video that Guy used, he, he kind of explains, when I talk about this, I'm calling it this. When I talk about this, I'm calling it this. I, I might call it something different, um, but it's, it's all kind of geared towards the same stuff. Perfect, excellent. Thank you, Mark, much, uh, much appreciated for your little chat there. Um, we'll go on to Ian. Ian, you good to go? You ready to rock and roll? Yeah. Uh, I can think I can, you should have a, a random gaggle of folk on your screen. Yeah, we have. Hello from Chamonix again. Uh, they're, they're, um, most of those pictures are a couple of friends of mine and his children. Um, they're on the, were on the Junior Freeride World Tour and most of those were us gathering at the end of the season for the, the finale out here in Chamonix. Um, Snow-wise out here, you wouldn't believe how quickly it's melting. Uh, the garden has gone from about two, two and a half feet to about half a foot in five days. Uh, it's very, very warm. But um, what we'll do, we'll dive into uh, a bit of a nitty gritty on some off piece stuff. And then um, a few things around sort of the clues to look out for, whether you're skiing backcountry or whether you're skiing lift access, off piece, those sorts of things. And then finish off with... Uh, a wee sort of montage of some very random skiers in very random situations. So we'll uh, we'll crack on. Oh. So, um, what's the stuff that really gets people into trouble on off-piste and backcountry travel? Um, so often in resorts, when we're skiing off the piece, we're, we're kind of in, a, in this weird bubble that it is fundamentally a safe place to be. The resorts have a, a duty of care to make sure that areas are safe for anyone to ski within the ski boundary, and that includes in between the pieces. Um, 
But as soon as people start to stretch and flex that ducking under ropes or and going into closed areas, or they're starting to venture sort of the backside of a mountain, if you will, of getting the lift access up there, going outside the, the ski ski area. There are some critical things that we tend to tend to miss. And that's um, the six things on the screen are that people make these decisions, basically they, they either don't know or they do know and they're prepared to take the risk. The other thing that we'll touch on uh, in a little bit is um, some of the clues and I'll give you five or six things to take away and also a, a PDF, a download. Um, if you are ever in Chamonix, you can pick them up here with, uh, they're on waterproof paper in some of the cafes and stuff. I leave them lying around. It's just a little checklist, aid memoir to have, have in your pocket. If you remember last week, we spoke about communication and traveling a little bit more and selecting terrain. If there's any doubt, if snow is gonna be the problem, Terrain is your answer, it's simple as that. So gradient, there is so much talk around what terrain avalanche is happening. Um, rule of thumb, it's basically 30 degrees and over, though about 10 minutes before I joined uh, the, the call today, something flashed up in um, my email from Bass, uh, which is, uh, organization that developed Know Before You Go in the US about um, 25 degrees and upwards. I haven't read it. Uh, this graphic, 30 degrees, not steep enough. Hmm. I've seen slides on less than 30 degrees. The difference being they tend to be slower. It's got to be really unusual conditions. This year in those same spots where I saw them actually January last year, you're looking at sort of 26, 27 degrees. They tend to be slow, quite sluggish. Yeah, they could knock you over. Um, you're gonna find that they're probably spring type avalanches. They're very wet rather than the soft slabs or the, the wind slabs that we see earlier in the season. At the moment out here in the Alps, it's 15 odd degrees outside. It's bonkers warm. It's kind of a bit of a replay from last year um, in the Alps and over in the Pyrenees where it, yeah, it, it's spring skiing and the dangers when avalanches happen at the moment, they're probably going to be quite of a significant size. They're going to have a lot of water content. But broadly speaking, the sort of skiing that the, uh, the sort of terrain that avalanches happen is going to be upwards of 30 degrees. 38 degrees is the sweet spot that if you remember last week's case study um, with that lady, 38 degree pitch. And the reason for that is because people that are skiing sort of red, red run, black run type terrain, and these figures are very, very broad um, in terms of the, the gradients, but they're the type of skier that's starting to venture off, off piste into the back country. And remembering that triangle, that one of those things that causes avalanches, you have to have a trigger. And the people that are usually caught in the avalanche are the ones that have also triggered that avalanche. And if you, any of you have skied in, in Lazouche, um, the, the Kandahar downhill course from top to bottom is around about 41 degrees on average. But I think that's there's two particularly steep, steep pitches in that. The rest is actually quite sedate. So it's, uh, it's worth just having it, figuring out what, uh, what sort of terrain you're skiing on. Now, seven clues. This whole schematic, um, I will forward to Ali in a PDF, uh, so you can you can take this away. Um, I provide them on all the avalanche courses we run uh, in that waterproof paper, um, so it just lives in people's pockets. This sort of the number one sign that the back country might be dangerous or off piece might be dangerous is if you see another avalanche that you know was in the last 48 hours. That is the mountain basically taking a bloody great wet fish and slapping you around the face with it. Um, it is that simple. If you see a slide, you get up in the morning, you've seen something that has been um, avalanched overnight or that morning, 
then that's showing that there is instability. Just because the avalanche has happened doesn't mean to say that avalanche path is not going to avalanche again. Secondary avalanches, or you can have a soft snow avalanche that sat on top of a, a wind slab, and then secondary tertiary avalanches can happen after that. The other thing, if you're, you're skiing and you're in the train a lot, or um, for example, those of you who come out to Bakira Beret with Ali, uh, getting to know the terrain, there's certain areas that we know avalanches happen, and it's in particular only in particularly stable situations and conditions that we'd go and ski those lines. And understanding your terrain is the key. And also, if you get a chance in the summer, if you're wandering around Tino Valdez Air or you come to the Chamonix Valley, uh, La Tour at the head of the valley is notorious for avalanches. And because it's grossy alpine meadows of the right gradient. Grand Monte or Flagere and uh, Brevo in the Chamonix Valley, less, less avalanches happen because it's different terrain. They still do. There's different controls, those sorts of things. But these are seven clues that if you've got avalanches in the last 48 hours, the ratings three or higher, we spoke about that, that's considerable. All these are core signs. And if you're adding up three or more of these, when you're making your decisions, you have to make your next decision really, really carefully. Um, if you're on to the four, it's kind of like, okay, terrain is definitely my answer today. So rescue, I had a bit of a dilemma of how much detail to go in into the sort of rescue aspects today. And it's gonna be a very whistle stop tour because it's very easy to watch videos, to read stuff about rescue techniques and everything else. Um, there is tons of free resources on YouTube, on backcountry access, on Ortvox websites that take you through all sorts of systems. The number one piece of talk feedback that I get about from all the one day rescue courses I run is, my God, I need to practice more. And that's not with the transceiver and we'll, we'll touch on transceivers in a minute. That is actually on the probing and digging. The transceiver bit, the, the technology is so good. That is a really, really simple. Um, you should be getting to identifying the victim in that area in under three minutes, maybe four minutes tops um, in a sort of 100 square meter area. But the speed of the transceivers working and then the practice in your probing and then your shoveling is absolutely critical. So this is uh, some research that was done. Da -da -da -da. It's not that old. I think it's about seven or eight years old uh, overall. But in very simple terms, it's um, you're, you've got a longer survival rate if you're in an avalanche in Switzerland versus Canada. I don't know why, but that's kind of what the data reads. But that sort of magic 15 minutes is what we... Uh, typically teach globally about you've got the likelihood of survival um, from uh, suffocation anyway is 15 minutes. You can see you've got an 80% or more chance of uh, being happy, good survival rate uh, before then. After then, it plummets. And the reason for that is predominantly because your ears, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, everything will be rammed full of snow. Now, one of the things, if you remember the case study last week, uh, the lady that was buried, her buff worked its way up over her uh, nose and mouth. And she was buried for about 12 minutes before, we got, before her husband got an airway. And that chance of her buff coming, covering her nose and mouth was probably a, a significant factor in her having a sense of calmness rather than panic um, in that. So that's why when you hear about avalanche education, people bang on about 15 minutes, the graph on the screen paints the picture why. Um, longer than 15, 18 minutes, the, the survival rate goes down very, very rapidly. And um, this doesn't take into account of any trauma that people have suffered in terms of hitting rocks or trees or debris on the, on the way down. So, um, Kit, uh, two weeks ago, or session one, three weeks ago, 
Uh, we did have a look at Kit. Uh, that's available via Ali on his YouTube channel, I think. So transceivers. Um, if you have one or use one, I think that if you don't have one, they're getting pretty cost effective. Um, my personal choice, having used actually every, pretty much every single one of those transceivers in the picture, is uh, BCA, uh, Backcountry Access. But the technology in them is great. The reason why I like BCA is it is so simple. It doesn't have any bells and whistles of, it doesn't talk to you, it doesn't tell you who's got a pulse or not, or all these things. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, it finds another transceiver really efficiently, really quickly. The rule that I have um, in the morning, when I put my ski gear on, I put my transceiver on, I turn it on, I'm in the house. And the reason why I do that is because the amount of times I've seen and been with groups that we're skiing somewhere, our plans change and evolve through the day. And we decide actually what was going to be a piece day turns to an off piece day and how many people have actually got their transceiver on. So get into the habit of put it on, turn it on. It's, it's that simple. The battery life of transceivers in their transmit or send mode is a number of weeks. It's highly unlikely you're going to run out of battery power. If you look around a lot of the instructors, and it'd be interesting in the Q&A if any of the instructors have experienced this, whether they actually wear a transceiver. Most instructors I know in the Chamonix Valley have a transceiver on all the time, every single lesson. And I'm seeing that more and more and you've probably heard the news and seen the news over the last few years of avalanches over blue runs. Last year, uh, last year or the year before, there was a, uh, a slide at Bremont here that went over a, a link piece that was basically a green run. No one was caught in it. All these sorts of things. So the Reiko um, stuff in your, your clothing is great, but you need big pieces of kit to use that. All that is is a basically a piece of silver foil that reflects a certain signal. Um, the transceiver is the most um, reliable way of uh, being found. So just remember, put it on, turn it on. The time that I turn mine off is either when I'm safely in a bar or at home. And I'll point um, some links uh, later on to the BCA and Altvox websites. So you can watch some of the the full um, search and rescue of a transceiver, but a big question and the hardest bit is the digging. And there are white papers, there's research, there's a lot of study on the, the speed and effectiveness of digging and whether it's shoveling thrown over your shoulder or hoeing, all these sorts of things. Um, I'm always asked, well, how far should you go? And it's really simple, as fast as you bloody well can, as fast as you would want to be dug out. But what you'll find is you can't do much more than 20 seconds of digging and you're going to be digging for the average burial one and a half meters, probably seven or eight minutes. So you've got to figure out uh, your own pace. Give it a go. And it's when people come on the courses and we start probing and digging into um, plowed snow. So in car parks or the edge of the piece, if we find big piles of snow that have been moved by snow machines. We dig in those, everyone's going, holy moly, that's hard work. The bottom line really is if you're starting to venture off piste or certainly into the backcountry, even if you are going with a guide or a highly experienced ski instructor that specializes in working off piste or backcountry, go and do a rescue course and demand that your friends that you're going with do as well. Um, I have three buckets of people, friends uh, over here that I ski with. Uh, the first bucket is very, very small. Those people are, that I know are trained, I've seen them uh, affect rescues and everything else. And that's my selfishness because if something happens to me, I want to be dug out as fast as possible, found and dug out as fast as possible. The second bucket, uh, the maybe bucket that I think, hmm, they kind of talk a good game, but I'd like some validation. And then the biggest bucket of all are those people that I just don't know. And I suspect that, yeah, they've got all the gear, but they've got no idea how to use it. But all this really sort of builds up into why do we go here? So I'm just going to 
finish off with three minutes. This is a bit of a montage of uh, some play in the mountains over the last couple of years from the IAZ off cut off piste and backcountry courses. We did some video in there. Um, and also just some larking about with mates and other courses that I run over here in the Alps. So enjoy. There we go. I think a little bit of torture for some people coming coming through the comments there, mate. <laughs> I haven't seen, I didn't, I couldn't see the comments, so I'll have a quick squeeze. Um, anyone got any questions? Uh, let me go through and just quickly check on the uh, messages. Um, Someone was asking if you, if you, if there are any courses that you would recommend in UK and Europe, like rescue courses that you would recommend. Um, there's loads of them. The I I teach the American or North American syllabus on a one or three day course. Uh, the other providers of that are Avalanche Geeks, uh, Bruce and Mike over in Saint Gervais, or Chamonix Experience, uh, based in Chamonix. They do their airy courses. Um, I don't have lots of guides offer courses. The level of training varies depending on their passion. There's Stu out here that runs the Avalanche Academy. In the UK, I don't know. I really don't know. But any IFMGA guide that specializes in backcountry skiing, lofty skiing, 
will be able to take you through and run, a, I'd expect to be able to run a one day rescue course, certainly. Um, John Chandler's mentioned uh, Glenmore Lodge in Scotland. Uh, they have courses and I, I, I know, yeah. I've been to Glenmore Lodge and I've, I've been up there and done a few things with them. Uh, they do offer uh, quite a lot of different courses and there's a lot of stuff in the UK, obviously. Um, so, yeah, sorry, so was that you, Mark, going to say something? Yeah, no, I was, I was just going to say, I mean, first of all, you, you did wonder, like, how many um, instructors maybe wear, wear their transceiver. Sarah did mention that she always wears hers on, on, on piste or not, I, and I'm kind of with her. I think it's good to be prepared no matter what other people think. That's, I think people giving you funny looks is normally a, a place of ignorance, but I did know an instructor once that um, you went, while, while they were working in Aspen, they carried around their slippers for when, their, uh, for when their, their client took them to the nice places for lunch. That sounds far more inviting to me than, uh, than the transceiver sometimes. <laughs> I think um I, I think read that rare book. <laughs> I think the, the transceiver um mention there is you know with regards to certain people wear them all the time, um some people don't. I, I think safety wise now, I think it is something that's possibly gonna be become a thing of the norm that it might be that most instructors or especially um instructors that are working in the mountain, especially it, it might become part of the, the safety code to have to to um have it on you and have it switched on when yeah. you are out on the mountain because as you said on green piece blue piece i've, I've seen it happen right next to a, a very yeah. gentle slope um i've been on little avalanches happen they can they can affect at very low gradients as well so it could be something that is um is definitely looked at into the future that is is an essential part of everyone not just instructors but potentially everyone going onto yeah. the mountain having having that along with their mask yeah. One, stick it on. Yeah, just, it's just, not to help some, you just to throw some some kind of salt into that one a, a little bit. Um, I, I'm going to kind of this, and this is my two cents, and, and it's kind of based on on some knowledge of the data and information. But when when helmets first started to become more prevalent, uh, you you started to see the incident rate of people wearing helmets in that kind of 18 to 30 year old age category like skyrocket, and and it what it kind of showed is that that just giving someone the safety device or the extra safety kind of implement didn't change their education around that topic um and, and to me it's like the the education of transceivers and the rescue stuff like like ian saying is is every bit at least as important if not more so than actually uh than actually having it potentially um uh, and and yeah, I, I just think that's kind of worth worth mentioning. It's you know you don't want to be that that all the gear and no idea guy at the end of the day. I think it, it's a good point, Mark. It's a very good point. And the the helmet, whether it's transceivers, um, all these sorts of things. What I think with the okay, you can be hit by someone else in the ski area who can knock you over or twack you in the head with a pole or all these sorts of things. So a helmet's valuable. In that respect but in the same way with transceivers as ali was saying i can see them becoming a requirement certainly in some resorts that have perhaps higher risks and um, the risk profile of the ski areas or even to a point where certain lifts won't allow you on unless you've got that because there is definite objective danger and it's it's for me it's not about them not it's not about them learning necessarily how to use it if they're skiing in resort. It's to facilitate instructors and the uh, ski patrol to be able to knowingly go and be looking for transceiver signals rather than affecting a multiple stage different rescues, those sorts of things. Just because the snowpack is changing so much um, the last two or three years, it's unprecedented the way that the snow is shifting and changing and so forth, the number of avalanches we're having and therefore the number of incidents. So I would like to see it in respect of, yeah, I think it's a good thing. Like I, I generally think in resort helmets are great things. Um, backcountry, I don't wear a helmet, um, but yeah. Yeah, I see, I see John with his hand up there. So I'll let him go before I chime in again. That's yeah, okay. I was gonna say, John, do you wanna say your, your question? Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't know if this happens in other places and stuff, but I do know um, we take the club across the Bormule quite often, things like that, and they have an area of their hill which is classed as their free ride sort of area or something. 
if you come out that area, there's quite often um, police patrols. So if you're not wearing a transceiver, you're a fine straight away. No, no argument. You know, yeah. it's a whack of a fine. That's a, you know, um, and that's quite a heavily sort of um, monitored area by the sort of the, the sort of local police and stuff for that reason. Yeah, I can see more of that, particularly with the massive growth of free ride that lift access terrain. Um, I noticed Cadrona in New Zealand uh, opening one of the back bowls this year. They've just put in a new lift over the back, for those that know New Zealand. Um, so that's opening what was a backcountry terrain to, to regular skiers. What, whether they're actually doing more than putting a lift in, I'm not sure. So that could be one of those free ride areas. Well, ju just, to, um, just to throw another take into it as well, because I, I think obviously there's differences between North America and, and Europe with regards to just the way things like liabilities and stuff like that are approached too. Because for, because I think, and I could be way off base on this, but for a resort to say like within resort, within boundary areas, like to mandate that you need to have a transceiver, I think that then also puts them as responsible for saying, for, for saying um, you also need to know how to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's, there's that might put certain um, responsibilities onto them if they say you have to you have to use a transceiver to then to then provide the education for it as well. I, I see your fingers up there in a second, Joe. I'll come to you in a second. Um, the, because if you look at then what Japan does now, because that also used to be the mecca for for, for off piece stuff and just getting off of the sides into the trees. And that's become a bit more of a regulated process now too in that you have to go through a rope line into this tent where you get education on that stuff before you and you kind of have and i think you have to have bought a specific pass maybe as well to get in there maybe if anyone with experience skiing in japan i, I know i have plenty of clients have uh, uh, that could tell me more about that but I, I think there's more to it than just saying uh, you can you can make the transceivers so you have to everyone has to have one there's there's more around that with regards to a resort mandating that so it'll be interesting to see where it goes joe what's what's your experience from from jackson over there um well i'm kind of on the front line of this right now running a youth free ride team um on the ifsa junior circuit in america um we actually have a lot of venues these days that are mandated transceiver for every single athlete and every single coach uh, Big Sky in Montana do it. Grand Targhee in Wyoming also do it. Um, I'm sure Ian's seen what's been going on around here recently. Uh, we've had a a really, really, really ugly couple of weeks in terms of avalanche yeah. facilities around here. It's been horrible. Um, actually, uh, lost a, lost an acquaintance this week, which is kind of sad. One of my park crew got killed. Um, but it's, it's something that in terms of the inbounds transceiver usage, like uh, just one of our team groups on the weekend, um, I checked in with one of our older team groups and every single one of the kids was riding with a beacon on inbounds just because of everything that's recently been happening. And we were up in the top of Casper Bowl. I kicked a bit of slough at the top of Casper Bowl the other day. Um, nothing to worry about. But at the same point, like I can see inbounds usage um, becoming a really big thing sort of just automatically amongst the youth but like, they just see it as like another piece of equipment that they absolutely have yeah. to have and it's them that's leading it it's not us that's demanding it until you yeah. get on venue we, we're not demanding it at all so, but, so it, it makes sense obviously joe i mean for, for that kind of thing what education are the kids providing in addition to saying that they need to have these these uh, transceivers for for competition is there any kind of education that's mandated behind that the IFSA, I don't believe, actually mandates anything. But within teams, I know I've seen a lot, re like this season, I know Park City started this season by doing an avalanche course this year. That was their first week. We're discussing doing that next year here for us. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the other competing athletes around the area actually have dedicated backcountry programs now as well. And what we do is we, we have a BCA training park in Bounds and Jackson. We'll take the kids up there and make sure they know what they're doing. But I mean, most of us have actually gone out and gotten RE courses like already of their own volition. I think mm. our youngest um, our youngest person to actually have an RE level one uh, turned 13 two days ago, and she got it when she was 12. And, um, yeah, Joe, firstly, um... I think that's an interesting point. I did my uh, pro qualifications with Don Sheriff and Sarah at uh, the American Avalanche Institute in Wyoming, in Jackson. So yeah, I've been watching closely at the sort of sad news recently. 
I think the so the club de sport in Chamonix, the free the kids free ride uh, club, uh, you're not allowed to go. You don't get on the lift unless you've got a transceiver on. Um, I think the Mark, your points about the training, the liability, it depends what the the purpose is. I'm no lawyer or uh, anything else, but it's if it's the duty of care of the ski area when it's open, if they can make their role more straightforward by knowing that actually everyone that skis that lift and in that area has a transceiver on, it's not about whether they can find someone and that debate with kids. A friend of mine's son uh, got stuck in avalanche last December um, and we had lots of debate around, well, how much information, how much training do we provide kids and at what age? Do I want my 13 year old finding a dead body? No, absolutely not. I want them to know how to go. This is where I am on the mountain and go as fast as possible to get help. When they're about 15, then that debate comes, they can actually affect a rescue. Um, any younger than that, I would argue that they're not physically strong enough or fit enough to be digging one and a half, two meters. So for me, the, the transceiver isn't about the individual wearing it, having to know how to use it. It's there to enable and affect a very fast, efficient rescue with those people that are trained. Um, and I, yeah, like in, in the States, lots of places, the free ride parks, different areas of the mountain. The yeah, other people are realizing the risks profile of ski resorts is changing in certain areas partly through expansion, but also the volume of people accessing different areas in the, in the resort. You're on mute, Ali. Just a quick one. John Chandler has put on the, the messages, he's put probe, shovel, transceiver, slippers. Um, John, what, what do you mean by that, mate? Uh, that was a comment to this, about slippers earlier. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my friend that worked in Apple. <laughs> he also tells another story of a, of a guy that was teaching a client and um, it was a terrible weather day and the client decided to throw in the towel like mid-morning and he asked his instructor, hey, do you have your passport with you? And the guy said, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. So they hopped in his private jet and flew to Mexico for lunch. So, you know, <laughs> so that's, that's asking for you. Yeah. Oh my! I have so many of these from Jackson that I could be here all day. Yeah, um, I'll, get, I'll give you, like I'll give you one. Um, the best one was when Little Wayne came snowboarding, and uh, with his entire entourage, hired a snowboard instructor for the day, took two runs down the bottom of the mountain, decided he didn't like it, went back to the Four Seasons and told his entourage to tip the man. Um, the guy got like a five thousand dollar tip, I think it was, for skiing two runs on the bunny hill, and got to go home at like half past ten. <laughs> Excellent. I, I heard a Does good that story. Set the bar for tips for the instructors now. Yeah, I, I I know a good one for for those of you that know John Farnham. I I know a person that that taught him, but he had to put a lot more hours in to get the tip that he got. But um. I, I also, there was a story when Justin Bieber tried to hire out a uh, resort in Ontario for the day because he's from, from Ontario and they wouldn't let him, you know, because obviously they, there's other people like to ski there. Apparently Justin Bieber didn't like that they, the resort, you know, wanted other people to actually be able to ski that day as well. So, Oh, poor Justin Bieber. Yeah. Oh, dear. Um, all right, cool. cool. Um, if if um, well, there's no more questions coming through at the moment, so obviously... If, uh, if there is any more questions than you want to put to, to Ian, <clears throat> obviously let us know and we can always contact Ian. And uh, if Ian's okay with coming back next week, just yeah. doing sort of a follow on, we can we can sort of delve into a few things a bit more there. Um, but yeah, thanks Ian, as, as always. Excellent, lovely. Didn't, didn't make me too jealous at all with the, the, the powder skiing there and wanting to be on the mountain. And uh, um, I'm sure everyone else is feeling a little bit dubious of seeing that. So, um, but much appreciated. Um, excellent as ever. No worries. Um, Thanks for having me, guys. Pleasure, pleasure. Um, Scott Westcott, there he is. Scott, um, are you good to do your little little chat about some telemark, and then um, we'll? Uh... Yes, I am. Yeah. Good, good man. The floor Shall is I, yours. Uh, the floor is mine. Is it right here? 
Okay, basically what I'm going to do is, um, let's have a look here. Why am I just seeing you, Ali? Um, um, you should, you, can you put it <laughs> top, top right? There we go. There's a guy, right. Um, yeah, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a little bit of history about Telemark and what it actually is, and then I'm just going to show you some videos, and then next week I can bring in some different equipment. Um, it's all Telemark equipment, but there are different boots and bindings there's a whole world of them um, but we'll just show you the basic two types um, so basically um, Norway is the home of skiing I'm in Norway I'm in Halfjell outside of Lillehammer home of the 1994 Winter Olympics um, and the so that is called the home of skiing and and that was because obviously back then before global warming and Norway was covered in snow for <laughs> most of the year um, and it's a very mountainous country um, and the ski was invented as far as we know by the Norwegians and ski means the Norwegian word for ski which is she it means cleft piece of wood a uh, bent piece of wood basically um, and back in the day it used to be one long ski and one short ski and the long one was used for gliding and the short one was used for kicking um, and from that has come the different disciplines of skiing, which is alpine skiing, telemark, and cross country are the ones that we really know. Um, and from there, the skis are different in size and weight, weights, as we spoke about with the new Rosnioles and free ride skis and blah, blah, blah earlier. But, you know, cross country skis have got much thinner um, and they're only connected at the tip. Uh, telemark skis are now basically alpine skis. You can use any ski, it doesn't really matter. But with touring ones, they're thinner and lighter or with different materials to make them lighter. And then the on-piece ones are basically alpine skis these days. There's no real difference except for the binding and the boots and, of course, the technique. Um, the, the, uh, the, the name Telemark comes from the, the county called Telemark, which is in the middle south of Norway. Um, west of Oslo, um, which is a very mountainous region. Um, if any of you have seen the film or read the book by Ray Mears, The Heroes of Telemark, um, that is where it all happened with the heavy water in Rukan. Um, and Telemark comes from there, uh, basically from a guy, uh, a young boy called Sondra Nordheim from a place called Morgadal in Telemark. And he basically decided he wanted to have a bit of fun sliding up and down. And he, he actually uh, started to uh, create carving skis way back then. They've got some of his first skis that he made. He was a carpenter and he made much like Mr. Rosniel. Um, and he made skis, carving skis and with rocker, uh, wider skis. Um, and he used to walk up and ski down and jump off of roofs and everyone thought he was mad. Um, and he basically uh, invented the two types of turn. One, many of you will know as the, the Christiania turn, or which we know as the Stem Christi, which is more of an American turn. Um, Oslo used to be called Christiania before it's called Oslo. Um, so it's called the Christiania turn. And the other was the Telemark turn. Um, and that is the one which is where we go down and we bend one knee stepping forward onto the front ski and the back foot is bent. Um, what I'm gonna do is, I'm not gonna talk too much about the equipment ones, is I'm basically show you some videos if I can. I've never done this sort of thing before. So you have to, uh, let's have a look. Um, well, there we go. I don't know why, can you guys, Ali, can you see this? No, not at the moment, mate. Are you on to screen share? Yeah, the, I think so. Green green button at the bottom. Right. Just click that, and then it should be able to take you to your page you want to want to share. Right, let me have a let me have another go here. Uh, yeah, you, you should you should have to select the page that you want to share, and then click the blue button share in that box. Okay, hang on a sec. Right, so the screen share at the bottom there. Yeah, see the arrow desktop. Um, and then it's an open system preferences. <clears throat> should, should say <laughs> top top left. Has it got a highlight on your? Oh, you, you, 
Are you, are you on a Mac or you? Yeah, on I'm on Mac. a Mac. Oh, you might you might have something switched off where it's preventing you from actually sharing your screen. Um, ah. Right. Um, let me have a look here. Let me see how I can do this. I want to do that again. Bear with me a second. Probably no. telling you to go. In. You know, if if you want a few minutes, Scott, I've got another video I can show to the guys. It will give you like five minutes to 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 have a look at it if you want. Yeah, do that if you want to take over the bump skiing part again. I, I if 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 me sharing a screen messes with you doing anything, just let me know and we'll we'll just chat instead for the meantime. But there was another video. You okay, there was another video I thought I could show you guys it, it, in the meantime here. Um. Uh, um. Well, unless you, I, well, I'll tell you what. Um. Maybe in the chat, would people like to watch the Bricage and hockey stops as the shorter ones? Or would people like to watch this Origins of Freestyle Skiing? That's eight minutes, so maybe a bit long on, on that one. Uh, as, as a as a as a idea in the chat, what would people's preference be just to spend a couple of minutes here looking? Uh, hockey stops, please. Hockey stops. Here we go. Those right. speak first, get get what they want. Exactly. Uh, just to, just bear in mind that as we watch this, this is information that the CSI put out specific with regards to what they're looking at whilst doing this at the level four exam. It's not necessarily the only way of doing a hockey stop, the only way of developing it, the only way of challenging it, etc. So just kind of keep that in mind that this isn't the be all end all of hockey stops either. Hey gang, here on a very snowy day at Lake Louise. Uh, we're into March already, which means uh, you're probably also buckling down on your, your training for the level four exam. So keep at it. What I wanted to do is provide a little bit of clarification on a few of the ski off maneuvers, primarily the, uh, the demonstration tactics, just to give you a little bit of focus and to clarify uh, across the country what we're, uh, what we're looking for. All right, so the hockey stop. The hockey stop is uh, there to help define turning with the lower body, right? So turning the, the legs separate of the upper body. Uh, as well as, of course, bounce using all the joints, and then uh, a crisp stop that comes through the use of uh, some angles so the ski gets up on its edge and brings you to a nice crisp stop with a pole plant. All right, so the straight run into the hockey stop is in the fall line, and it is straight, so no pre-turn before the skis get on their edge and bring you to a stop. Training yourself, you can help yourself figure out whether you've been successful with that, by watching where your feet end up when you stop based on your straight run, right? You straight run into the fall line, just you turn the legs and you come to that crisp stop right there, you'll notice that your feet are directly in the fall line, lining up with where you straight ran in to make that stop. Mark, I think Scott's almost ready. Yeah, are you ready to go, Scott? Yep, I certainly hope so. <laughs> I'll give it a go. Right, here we go. So let's have a look. Screen share desktop. There we go. Uh, there we go. Look at that teamwork. Look at that teamwork. How about get rid of that? And then... Gorgeous girl. There she is. Right. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a, a film of uh, yours truly telemarking and I'm going to show it to you in full speed um, and then uh, in the same run in slow motion. So you can really see what it is. And what we're doing is, is we are basically stepping forward onto the front ski, which the front ski acts the same like in Alpine turns with the outside ski. It will be the it will be the one that's in front of you and on the outside, and that's where we have most of our pressure. Um, and then in the transition of the turn, which is in between the turns, then we stand up and we step forward onto the new ski and turn it around. Um, you can carve, you can ski bumps, you can ski everywhere um, as you can on alpine skis with, with practice, of course. Um, so let's see how this one works uh, 
Is this, can you see all of this? Okay. Good, mate, yeah. Okay, so basically, um, let's have a look. And then I've got the same one in slow motion. Okay. Oh, this is a slightly different. Sorry about the music there. <laughs> and then the same run again in even slower motion. So now you can really see the movements and the motions that are going on. That's really good in the slow-mo, Scott. So there we have um, the same run in three different ways. Um, uh, and for any of you who have never skied in Norway before, there's a lot of people that oh, can you actually ski in Norway? You know, and what's it like? Um, that was a pretty close up shot. So this one is the, the IAZ one I did for the Irish Association. So you can see this is, this is an average day in the slopes um, in Harfjell. It's normally pristine conditions, blue skies, and there's always very, very few people there. Um, this has been this year where we've had a private ski resort, um, basically no one at all, but you can see that we're, we've got a fair amount of altitude. And you, the resort is currently open, isn't it, Scott? Yeah, the resort's open. It's running perfectly normal. So, I mean, we can see we can see from uh, um, area sort of. Yeah, let's have a look. You can see here the you know down the valley. It's we've got about almost a thousand meters vertical. Um, so you know it's we've got about thirty kilometers worth of slopes, um, but we don't have any people here. Um, so you you do get more for your money, um, and the snow is very good normally all the time it's a little bit warm at the moment um and one of the things that you do get here is the fact that the bottom down where you can see the river is around 200 meters and the top is about 1100 so you're skiing way below you not what you normally would in the alps so you get you've got a lot more energy because you're not as tired because of altitude sickness and so on and the difficulties of skiing at altitude um but I've got, I've yeah, got to I mean, say basically, from, from my skiing. Sorry, Ali. I was just going to say from my skiing there when me and Julie came over and from when I ran the exam there, it, it's a fantastic resort. It, it blew my mind how amazing it was. So it is um, awesome over there in Norway. Yeah. So if we if we just go through the telemark turn here, we can see that here at the point it's the what we call the pressure phase where we're at the at the towards the end of the turn. Um, and that's where you're normally at your lowest point. And then where we do our pole plant would be the point where we are standing up at our full extension, pretty much like an alpine turn, and then into the telemark position, which is pretty much something like that. If we look at the outside ski, you can see that the ankle is bent, the knee is bent, the hip is bent. My hands are up and forth just like an alpine turn. I'm just a bit lower. 
um, and then the back foot is there um, as the inside ski because it so that when we come into the the new turn we see there we step forward again um, now one of the things one of the questions I often get asked is as we've been talking about bumps with Mark, is can you ski bumps on telemarks? Well, you can ski bumps on telemarks. And it's actually quite easy. Well, <laughs> sounds, is, is skiing bumps easy? Um, once you've learned the, the, the theory behind it and you've done your practice, yes, it is. They, they kind of do half the work for you, but on telemarks, it's the other way around. It actually does all the work for you because it's like walking downstairs you're just stepping one foot in front of the other. Um, so this is a, a bump run from half in. Is that a competitive like bump site there? Is that a training bump site, Scott? It's, it's one that I make, yeah. So it's it's quite it's quite mellow. It's not that steep, but um, yeah, it's you can see that if we look at the motion, it's we I'm stepping over into the valley and it, absorbing and extending, absorbing down the valley the same as you do on a bump on alpine skis, and then absorbing. And trying to extend down, absorb, extend down. So it's it's the same technique, but I've always found telemarking in bumps uh, easier than uh, than on alpine skis. Um, so uh, that what so what I'll do next week is I will um, bring in some of the equipment, and uh, we can. Uh, how do I get out of this stop share? There we go. There you go. Um, there we go. Um, we can bring in the actual boots, two types of boots and two types of bindings and show you how they work and how they bend and so on and so forth. Um, so if you have any questions, you can, if we have anything now, I can answer or um, I can happily uh, answer them next week. I think what would we'll, what we'll do, Scott, is if, if we get some questions and that prepared for, for you for next week, so you've got a bit of an idea what people are asking, I'll, I'll get some uh, emails sent um, over to you so you've got some of that. And then, yeah, we, you can evolve the, yeah, sure. the technique and the, the equipment from, from what we send over on the, on the um, email, okay? Yeah, fine, yeah. I'm pro yeah. I'm, it, there's a question just coming, actually, um, from John Chandler. I'm probably preempting next week's session, but... What are the pros, cons of the NTN bindings? It's been 10 years since I last telemarked. Um, the, I guess the, it depends on whether how purist you are. Um, you know, we, we often have this discussion and that is, you know, people say, oh, you know, well, it's not telemarking because you're not using the, the old bindings. So, well, then sell your car and get a horse. You know, <laughs> let's move on, people. <laughs> it's, 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 we've, we've, moved on you know get back to leather boots and and telemark you know those bindings because that if you're using alpine equipment and alpine skis and bindings then you're a hypocrite if you're saying that telemark should be this way um basically they're heavier um but that's about it if you're resort skiing but then again it depends on if you are doing ski touring how far you're actually going up because the MTN makes the descent so much better. That simple. Um, I see absolutely no cons in the MTN binding. I, I only see pros. I think it's a fantastic, fantastic binding and, and boot system. Cool, oh, perfect. Um, Richard Featherstone, you've just put telemark. Is that as a, as a thumbs up? You, you're liking it? Or is there a, another question behind that? He, he was saying that he'd like to, I think he'd. Like the IAZ uh, telemark instructor courses at Snow Centre. He was yeah. running the mark in addition to the IAZ instructor courses. We do them. We've done about seven now, I think, isn't it, Ali? Like it's, it's, been, it's been quite a few years they've been run. And I, I think, have you got one planned for this October, November, Scott? Uh, yeah, we, we've, we had to um, 
we had to uh, cancel the last one, obviously, but we've got one set up for October, I think. There so you go, October, Richard, November. November. It depends on when the half term is in relation to that. So, and, and obviously, if, if you need some specific telemark training, I'm, I'm readily available. You know, I, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm quite happily. I, I'm a level yeah. one telemark, which Scott took me for. Um, I, I know the basics. I, I can run through an intro and get people used to it. But obviously, if, if and, Scott was here, I'd say let go go with Scott. <laughs> yeah um but i mean we have we have because telemark equipment is very hard to get get hold of <clears throat> every year i come over i normally over here in norway you can pick it up for you can actually pick it up for free because people are trying to give it away because i don't telemark anymore um so i normally buy a couple of pair of boots and bring them over so uh, pete gillespie actually has quite a lot of telemark equipment for people to use which is sort of our little private stash it's not part of the snow center it's it's our thing so if you do want to go to the snow center then and telemark you can ask uh, contact Pete or through ali and they will see if they've got any boots or skis to fit you yeah we, we've got we're a couple of to, couple of to do in. some in the summer ali yeah we could yeah, do we, some in the summer yeah yeah no problem we can organize that mate no problem at all so um, and one of the things about Telemark as well, for those of you that do ski in the uh, in the snow centre, there's 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 two advantages to it and doing it in the snow centre. It makes Telemarking makes the mountain bigger because it's harder work to do. It is it is harder work, but in the snow centre you've got whatever it is, 120 metres long, so you do that. The other thing is is you're only connected at the at the toe, and your your balance and rotational point on a set of telemark skis becomes far much more specific because you don't have that ability of the alpine binding and boot to beast it around if you make a mistake you have to be a lot more delicate and what will happen is even if you go out alpine skiing on telemark equipment your alpine skiing will or your feeling on your alpine skiing will get better um because you, you there's a there's a it's it's just more specific um and it's it's a it's a it's a it's also the boots are more comfortable, which is nice, to, depending on if you've got uncomfortable boots or not, I guess. But generally, <laughs> they are. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it, it, it gives you a different feeling. And I remember uh, through one of my seasons in the Alps, I basically decided this was going to be my season to telemark, and I tellied for a good three months, didn't step on alpine skis. But when I did put alpine skis on, I was a better alpine skier through not alpine skiing and just telemarking. Perfect. Um, another couple of quick questions, Scott. Um, can you sure. use frame touring bindings to telemark? No. There we go. There's, the, there's the your boot, answer, Jess. The boot doesn't bend. It's, it, the boot bends at the toe. It bends like a regular shoe. Okay. All right. Cool uh sarah is telemark okay with knackered knees already got a metal knee um i i actually have uh, two two knees operated and the other one i thought i'd busted in january and it so turns out it's okay um yeah because what what you're doing is is with alpine skiing the knee the knee often just re it gets bent like that with with telemark the whole knee is opening and closing you're engaging a lot more muscles and and ligaments in the process it's not quite as a, as a, a vibration type skiing it's much more fluid um if you have a knee brace which I don't know if you do use that or not um that will of course give you both both uh, lateral support and uh, and forward and backward support um, and if you use the ski mojo um, that I've actually tried on telemark there is a video out there somewhere on on uh, on YouTube um, if you just write in ski mojo telemark you will find that video um, and that was uh, amazing to use uh, it really made telemarking quite easy because it does the job for you you actually don't use any muscles at all <laughs> um yes you can yes there we go cool excellent thank you scott um you're welcome a few, pe few people have got to go uh, john chandler might have to have a refresher john if you want to organize something we can get maybe a group of people together and all all have a bit of a uh, bit of fun on some telemark skis 
we can uh, we can easily set that up. That's not a problem. Um, yeah, so I think what we'll do, Scott, is we'll, we'll gather some more questions, get some info over to you, and then if you can get yep. a little, little thing together for next week, that'll be great, and we can get a little bit more detail going on the, on the telemark. Um, so we yep. have got a few people that have now jumped off, so I'm, I'm only going to sort of do a, a quick little quick little roundup. Um, first off, thanks to everyone that came today, um, to Chris, to Mark, to Scott, Ian for delivering what they've delivered and for everyone attending. Um, I mentioned in the email that we sent out that we're going to get together uh, and do an instructor uh, session uh, separate to like the Wednesday session. And, and me and Mark have looked at some Saturdays and we're going to send a date out for anyone that wants to talk specifically about instructor and qualifications and preparation for exams, whether it be level one, two, three, or four, we're going we're gonna to put stuff like that together. And if you want to start firing some questions into us, whatever it will be on regards to um, instructor qualifications, we'll do it as a separate um, session to this one, just so we can keep the flexibility of more uh, interaction on different subjects on this one. But we'll do an instructor-based only session on, uh, on a Saturday in a couple of weeks' time, and I'll, I'll fire the information out for that. And if again, if you've got some pre-questions, then feel free to send them in and let us know what you want to uh, talk about. Uh, I'll obviously speak to John and see if John will come on from Snow Sports England point of view, talk a, a little bit from that process. Mark obviously will know Canada and IAZ. I know Scotland, Basie and um, IAZ. And we might then try and get another couple of uh, people, uh, maybe a Basie uh, examiner and someone else, just to come on and give a whole rounded view on all different qualifications and, and so on. So we'll, I can I can do the Norwegian one if needed. As yeah, well. we got there. We got Scott as well from uh, the Norwegian system. So um, we'll get a few of us together and we'll, we'll do that as a separate note. OK, but um, thanks to everyone for those that have uh, been with us the whole time. It is now two hours and 48 minutes we've been going for. So hopefully um, it's kept most of you entertained and uh, it's broken up your week. And um, good to see some familiar faces and see that people are smiling and doing all right and everyone's doing OK. And hopefully we'll see you all in seven or eight weeks time. We'll have a big party at the Snow Centre when it opens up. Well, well, we'll go skiing, but, you know, we can't socially meet and, you know, but <laughs> hopefully sooner rather than that, we can all get together. So I um, hope you all enjoyed it. And thanks for coming. And uh, from Julie and me. Mark, Scott, and Chris, and um, um, Ian, almost forgot Ian. Um, thanks to everyone for staying on, and uh, see you all soon. Have a good rest of the week. Bye for now. Thank you, guys. See you, guys. Cheers, guys. Bye.